Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about these incredible discoveries in regards to fundamental physics. And more specifically, we're actually going to be combining two different discoveries, which in a sense suggests that our understanding of fundamental physics is still not really perfect, because both discoveries suggest that something else is going on in the universe that we don't really understand. And what I'm actually going to be discussing is the very recent announcement from the Fermilab of the so-called G-2 experiment that has been confirmed officially to have something unusual going on in it, and also this completely other discovery from CERN in Switzerland, which also suggested something else going on with a completely different particle in a completely different experiment. Both discoveries were made only approximately a week apart, and both to some extent are kind of groundbreaking, at least for the particle physicists. For us, for normal people, we still don't really know what all of this means. But, as always, let's start with the baby steps. So today, in modern physics, the so-called standard model of particle physics is probably the best model we have for the world around us. Basically, the 17 different subatomic particles you see right here more or less represent what we believe happens in the world around us, at least when it comes to particle interaction with the idea known as QCD or quantum chromodynamics being responsible for explaining how all of these subatomic particles interact with one another. And over the years, over the past few decades really, a lot of different experiments conducted in various particle accelerators for the most part have been consistently proving this idea over and over. All of the theoretical predictions such as for example the famous Higgs boson were eventually confirmed by various experiments in for example CERN inside the Large Hadron Collider located in Switzerland. Now, all of these experiments over the years, once again, allow the scientists to quite confidently say that our understanding of the world, and specifically the standard model of physics, for the most part seem to have been correct. But the model was obviously still not perfect. For example, it still didn't really explain very well how gravity works or how objects are able to attract each other. It also didn't really explain the mysteries of the universe such as dark matter, but more importantly there were some experiments that created the results that were kind of difficult to explain. And one such famous example from 1990s was what's known as the Brookhaven experiment, although according to Google it's also some sort of a VR shooter game which I don't think I'll ever be playing because it kind of looks scary. Anyway, that one experiment created a tiny problem for the particle physicists which for the past few decades they've been kind of trying to figure out. But what exactly is this problem and why is it a problem? Well, it really has something to do with the predictions of one of these subatomic particles. And specifically this particle right here known as muon. As you can see, it's pretty much the cousin of electron, except that it's dramatically more massive, like 200 times more massive. But in every other respect, it is very similar to electron. As a matter of fact, other properties like spin and electric charge are exactly the same as an electron, so the only main difference here being the mass. And one of the main reasons we're not really as familiar with muons compared to electrons is actually because we haven't really found a practical use for them yet. Electrons are obviously used everywhere, that's how electricity works. But for muons, one of the only uses we have for them so far are, for example, various types of penetrating scanners, such as ground penetrating scanners, which muons can do much better than electrons, because they're basically more massive and can easily go through matter and thus detect objects much deeper in the ground. As a matter of fact, right now, as I'm speaking to you and as you're listening to me, or more specifically in the area around one square meter around you, about 10,000 muons go through that area every single minute. And the way that they form is through the interaction of cosmic rays coming from very powerful quasars, supernova and a lot of other powerful objects out there with the upper atmosphere of planet Earth. And as these elements strike the upper atmosphere, the muons that are generated as a result go through pretty much everything including you and including the ground underneath. And some of them can actually even go through the entire planet entirely. So muons are generally really good at penetrating things. And so over the years the scientists have learned quite a lot about them and one of the properties that is known to scientists about muons is that if you were to place them in the magnetic field they would basically start spinning. And this spin itself is known as the G factor with the G factor for muon being G minus 2. So next time you hear someone say muon G minus 2 that's basically what they're referring to. They're referring to this predicted value of a muon spinning inside the magnetic field. But it turns out that this value is actually not really 2. 
with the main reason being virtual particles predicted by the quantum physics. As these virtual particles start to appear everywhere, they actually interact with the spin of muons and end up increasing the value by just a little bit. So it's not really two, it's more like 2.002331 and so on. And this value that you see right here was the predicted value from the most recent very very thorough analysis from 2020 that was released by a lot of scientists working together. Now this is a mathematical prediction value and it just so happens that that experiment I mentioned previously, the Brookhaven experiment, found this value to be a little bit different. Something wasn't really adding up. And so for the past few decades, the scientists in different labs were trying to recreate these results with the Fermilab, whose video I'm using here, essentially even getting a completely new super powerful magnet just to study this effect, just to find out if there is something going on after all. And well, as you can probably imagine, after years and years of studies, they finally have the results. And the results, well, let me show you the picture to summarize this. The results sort of confirm the original Brookhaven result and definitely go against the predicted model that was just confirmed last year. And even though the actual difference is really, really minuscule, the experimental results here don't really align with the standard model predictions. The difference is quite significant. Which means that both experiments found some sort of an anomaly suggesting either A, the 17 subatomic particles we have here do not necessarily explain the whole world around us. There might be some other 18th hidden particle that was just discovered. Or B, something completely different, something that nobody really understands yet, is happening to the spin of these muons, which might be some sort of a fundamental discovery in regards to muons that nobody has ever made before. Either way, for the particle physicists, this is one of the biggest groundbreaking discoveries of the last 50 years. But to make sure that this is a real discovery and not some sort of fluke, because there is still a tiny, tiny chance that maybe this was a mistake, and specifically here we're talking about one in three million chance, the scientists are going to be conducting this experiment five times in total. And if after five times they still get the same results, well, in that case, there's definitely something going on. And so in that sense, it's a discovery that doesn't have an explanation or even theory behind it. Nobody really knows what's happening here. But that's just one of the discoveries. Remember in the beginning I mentioned there were two discoveries? Well, the second one is completely unrelated, although maybe somewhat related. And by the way, check out the video from Fermilab if you would like to learn a little bit more detail about this discovery as well. But anyway, so Fermilab discovered one thing, but CERN in Switzerland discovered something entirely different and also unexplained. And in this case, it's kind of related to the main premise of the Large Hadron Collider, or basically its main purpose. Its main purpose is to study hadrons. It's to study the particles that are made out of elementary particles. So in this case, if we take one of the quarks, specifically an up quark, and if we combine it with a down quark and another down quark, we're going to get a neutron. If we combine two up and one down quark, we're going to get a proton. Those are hadrons. Hadrons are basically the larger particles that are made from subatomic particles. But we don't have to combine three of them. What if we combine one up and one down? We still are going to get a hadron, but it's not going to be stable and it's actually going to fall apart, creating something entirely different. And so that's pretty much what certain scientists have been doing for years and years and years now. And that's kind of the main purpose of the experiments there. They try to create hadrons, they try to destroy them, they try to collide them, and then try to see what happens. But a lot of this is also based on various theories, and many of these theories have been confirmed over and over and over again. And one of these theories is about this one hadron known as beauty meson. Okay, more terms. So this one is basically created from combining one down quark and one bottom anti-quark. So here we actually start using a little bit of antimatter. Although even here you can combine some other quarks to create slightly different beauty mesons. And just generally, to create a meson we need some sort of a quark and an anti-quark. But it cannot be the same anti-quark because then it just eliminates and creates energy. Anyway, long story short, the predicted model for these beauty mesons suggests that they do fall apart, creating an equal amount of electrons and once again muons. And more specifically, they should be producing an equal amount of electrons and positrons or muons and anti-muons. And so here, if we were to take about 100 of these beauty mesons with time, after only a few milliseconds, all of them should create approximately 50 electrons and approximately 50 muons. 
But as this paper that was recently released by certain scientists discovered, they don't. The data from this experiment suggests that a lot more electrons are produced compared to muons. And this once again suggests some sort of a problem with the theory and very likely suggests some sort of an unusual, not well understood and possibly completely unknown to us physics at work. Something that many scientists will be studying for years to come. Now, it could be related to the previous muon discovery, maybe muons are the actual culprits behind both of these discoveries, or maybe there is some sort of an unknown subatomic particle in existence that absolutely no one understands just yet, but at the same time, the real answer is that nobody knows. And this is of course the beauty of these modern experiments. Today we've reached a point where the experiments are so advanced and are so precise that it's very difficult to argue with some of these discoveries afterwards. And if the scientists have detected something, and especially if they've done it several times, it might indeed suggest new physics at work. And because we haven't really changed the fundamental physics for about 50 years now, in some sense for particle physicists, this is a groundbreaking discovery. But for us, for the normies, for people that don't really do particle physics, well, we don't really know what to think of this just yet. I mean, like I mentioned before, we don't even use muons in real life just yet. We don't really know what they're used for or what they can be useful for. But if muons one day do become as important as electrons, maybe then we might appreciate these discoveries a little bit more. For now though, it is more or less theory only. We still don't really know where all of this will lead and if it's actually going to help us explain the universe around us. Nevertheless, super exciting discoveries, very unusual how both discoveries happen around the same time, but hopefully in the next few years we'll know exactly what's happening here. Until then, that is pretty much all I wanted to mention in this video. I wasn't really sure if I'm going to be able to explain everything in one video, but I guess I tried my best. But there are definitely going to be a lot of follow-up videos as we discover more and more about these studies. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a pretty unusual and a pretty interesting discovery of a potential third type of subatomic particles. Although in this case, it's not a true subatomic particle, it's what the scientists refer to as a quasi-particle. It's a particle that sort of becomes only visible and only apparent in the presence of other, more simple subatomic particles. Now this concept is actually pretty complicated, but it's been theorized for many decades now, and it's known as anion. And it looks like finally, after years and years of speculation, the scientists have been physically proved that they can exist and they do form a kind of a third realm of particles that now have to be investigated in a lot of detail. And although by itself this whole concept is actually extremely complicated, I'm gonna try to explain it in relatively simple terms and also give you a practical reason for why this is actually important. The reason being quantum internet and quantum computing, something that a lot of different countries and a lot of different universities are currently actively trying to develop. So first of all, let's start with something a little bit more simple with the basics. What you're looking at right here is a representation of a proton, that same proton that's responsible for creating various atoms in the universe. And what's interesting about this particular image is that it actually shows you the two major types of particles, subatomic particles, present in the universe. Here we have both the fermions and the bosons. Now, in a nutshell, fermions, and in this example it's the quarks that are U, U and D, up and down quarks, with the other commonly known fermions being electron and neutrino, can be summarized as the subatomic particles that need to have their own space. They're basically kind of like the introverts of the subatomic particle world. For each of the electrons, for example, you have to have them in separate locations, in separate parts of space. They cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Which is actually why a lot of matter in the universe, such as, for example, the exotic matter, like the one we can find in the middle of a neutron star, starts behaving so strangely. That's because either neutrons or in some cases electrons start to get bunched up so close together that they actually start to produce a lot of really exotic interactions. They're essentially subatomic particles that do need to have their own space in the universe. Then we have bosons, which are these other types of subatomic particles that are, in a sense, extroverts. They can totally occupy the same space and share exactly the same point of space with other bosons. 
And in this image, the bosons are represented by these squiggly lines in between the quarks. This is what we refer to as gluons. The gluons in this case are responsible for essentially kind of connecting these quarks together. But from all of the bosons, you really just have to think about photons, the, you know, the stuff that produces light. We can technically shine exactly the same light at exactly the same spot, and it's totally capable of existing in the same spot at the same time without causing any exotic interactions or without causing any serious problems to anything in the universe. Something that fermions, like electrons, cannot do. So this is basically the main difference between the fermions and the bosons. And in general, fermions and bosons pretty much explain all of the interaction we see in the universe, with some minor exceptions. And for the most part, all of the visible matter in the universe falls under these two categories, and a lot of the interaction of the matter can be explained using either the fermion or the boson. And for many years, scientists have actually thought that maybe this is basically it, at least for our universe, for our three-dimensional world. But several physicists, specifically several theoretical physicists, did not really agree with this because they also realized that if you were to reduce one of the dimensions, in other words, if you were to turn three dimensions into two dimensions, you suddenly have a lot of these other unusual subatomic particles coming into existence and acting in very different ways. And one of the main proponents of this, and also the first person to actually kind of even explain all of this, is this scientist right here, who wrote this paper, you can find it in the description, Dr. Frank Wiljak, who essentially even kind of coined the term anion to explain that, you know, anything can go on in these conditions and anything can happen. It was really more of a play on words. But over the years, more and more scientists started to realize that maybe he was actually onto something. And specifically, they started to realize that by having only two dimensions, things like, for example, fermions, like electrons, would actually start acting a little bit differently and would start producing these unusual effects, at least in theory. This wasn't really practically proven and it was actually very difficult to prove as well. But the theory behind this was so solid that more and more papers started to come out in regards to this, started to explain how all of this could work, and most importantly, started to produce devices that can actually prove all of this and use these effects from these anions to possibly use them in some kind of a practical tool. And one of these practical experiments has actually been conducted by Microsoft, whose team is now convinced that this is maybe the future of quantum computing. And there's a really good reason for this. And that reason has to do with, in some sense, the definition of what anions are. So, in a sense, let's try to imagine what all of this means by using some of the images from this paper you can find in the description. In a normal three-dimensional environment, I can essentially take two particles and have one of them orbit or move around the other without really having it collide with that particle. So, for example, right here, these two random particles, in this case it's just golf balls, can more or less coexist with one another because of the third dimension. Even if I start trying to decrease the distance between them, they can always find a way to not really collide with one another and not to be in the same spot. And if we, for example, think of electrons, this means that these electrons can basically coexist in the same 3D location without really being in the same spot, which they're not allowed to do because they're fermions. But turns out things change completely once you remove one of the dimensions and force these electrons to do all of this in two dimensions. Which is pretty much what the scientists in this recent experiment were able to do by using this relatively complex device. When there's only two dimensions involved, at some point the two electrons are actually kind of forced to be in the same spot which ends up producing some really strange effects. The two electrons now start acting as this system. They basically become a kind of a joint system acquiring their own rules that are not really truly fermion rules and not truly boson rules. In other words, the system now becomes something completely different. It's neither fermion nor boson. And in this case, it even starts to meet all of the theoretical predictions and descriptions of the theory of anions. Which basically suggests that by placing electrons in a two-dimensional environment and by forcing them to do things they shouldn't be able to do, we are able to create these quasi-states, these anion states, that acquire their own properties and start acting as a kind of a quasi-particle with its own new rules and its own physical properties. And that's what makes this somewhat unusual and also extremely interesting. And from the perspective of quantum computing, what makes anions especially interesting is that they seem to actually possess what's known as memory. 
especially when it comes to this twisting or this spinning that you see on the screen. And the easiest way to explain why this is important, let's take a look at this example again. So right here we have these two golf balls in this certain position. Let's just imagine that these are electrons, although that's probably not the best analogy here. Now we want to recreate this state again, so in order for us to do this, we actually have to have this ball move around once, and I guess somewhere around here, we are now back to the original state. So after one spin, it's back to its original position and location, where we can kind of say that nothing has changed. But when it comes to these anions, this whole spin situation is a lot more complex. As a matter of fact, for a typical anion, theoretically at least, to return back to the original situation, original condition where it started, you would have to have anywhere from 3 to 5 to maybe even more spins. In other words, this whole spinning process can be used as a kind of a memory storage for a potential quantum computer. And this is exactly why Microsoft has been so exceptionally interested in this theory and has also been trying desperately to find a way to use these unusual quasi-particles to possibly create some kind of a super quantum computer that obviously no one really has any idea how to make just yet. And this type of a property is really important for any kind of a quantum computer, mostly because retention of information and also retention of any data in quantum computing is extremely hard. Quantum particles have a tendency to just do their own thing, they pop in and out of existence for example, they tend to have relatively low accuracy, but if you can find a way to control the actual memory of the quantum computer, and to have a system where the quantum information storage becomes more predictable, this changes the game completely. This now becomes a much more practical way of creating something that we can actually turn into, well, in some sense, another informational revolution, going from the classical computing age to the quantum computing age. And so according to this paper that you can find in the description below, this is exactly what the scientists in this paper were able to finally prove. They were finally able to show that anions indeed exist and seem to possess these properties that we kind of predicted they would have. And so in some sense they also discovered this third type of particles. But these particles are not really true particles, they are quasi-particles. They are just this new state of subatomic matter that only exists if other particles are already there. In some sense, you can think of it as, for example, a snowflake or any other complex shape. This shape by itself is formed by tiny water molecules that connect to one another in such a way that they actually form this very beautiful fractal formation. But this fractal by itself is a kind of a quasi-shape. It's a shape that arose out of the existence of other smaller particles. And that's kind of what anions are in a nutshell as well. They're not really particles by themselves, they only really become apparent and start existing when you take electrons, place them in two dimensions, add a lot of magnetic field to this, cool them down to practically absolute zero, and then have them interact with one another. That's when these anions become apparent and are basically formed by the collective behavior, collective action of these individual electrons. But practically speaking, we're still really far from our ability to use this knowledge and to use these resources to construct an actual computer. We're still years and possibly even decades away from even the first attempt to use all of this to create some kind of a practical quantum computer that can actually use this as a source of memory. Right now all of this is very very theoretical and still needs so much more work and so many more studies before all of this can come together and create something functional and something practical. Nevertheless, these are definitely super interesting discoveries and one day will probably lead to something absolutely incredible that we can create as humanity. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about some of the recent and extremely exciting research around the material that you see right here known as graphene. The material that in a sense could completely redefine our society and our civilization. And also something that many different scientists around the world studied for the past 16 years trying to discover a lot of really interesting properties of this strange material. But now we've discovered something else absolutely mind-blowing. So let's talk a little bit more about this and also some of the other major discoveries around graphene. Although there's no way I'm going to be able to cover everything because there's just way too much to talk about and way too many different things that this material is able to do. 
I would even go so far as to say that back in the days when the ancient alchemists were looking for this magical material that's able to do a lot of things and the material that is able to essentially dissolve everything or even provide things like immortality, well, in some sense, graphene actually is that one material that provides a lot of different solutions to various problems we have today. But let's actually talk about some of the major discoveries first. But also, what exactly is graphene? Well, it's basically something made out of graphite. You know, that stuff that you find inside the lead of your pencil. Normally, inside graphite, you'll find layers of carbon structured three-dimensionally. But if you were to somehow remove one of these layers, it will turn into something known as graphene, which also surprisingly starts to possess a lot of different functions that graphite did not have. One of these major functions is electroconductivity. Unlike graphite, graphene becomes electroconductive. So for the past 15 years, the scientists were trying to figure out if we can actually use this as a somewhat effective semiconductor for future electronics. Here's what the structure of this material looks like if you were to look at it in the electron microscope, and you can sort of see this unusual honeycomb formation that it creates, something that graphite itself does not possess unless you remove one of the layers. Now, we've actually known about graphite theoretically for many, many years, but it was originally rediscovered and in some sense isolated by these two wonderful researchers you see right here, who back then were working in the University of Manchester, and they won the Nobel Prize for their discovery, but it was actually made using these tools right here. They used a piece of graphite and then they used a typical scotch tape to try to extract thin layers of graphite, turning them into graphene. Discovering in the process that this was also apparently one of the strongest if not the strongest materials on the planet. But we've also known for a very long time that it possesses strange electromagnetic properties and because of its structure a lot of the electromagnetic properties can be actually modified by changing the structure. And so for example in one of the recent studies that was released only a few months ago the scientists were able to create these shapes that you see on the screen by essentially folding the graphene sheet into a slightly more deformed sheet. This was done by introducing atoms of boron in it to create these unusual structures. And what this ended up changing inside the graphene sheet is, well, it essentially turned it into a magnet. By changing the three-dimensional structure of graphene, the scientists were able to turn graphene into magnetic graphene which by itself will already provide so many different applications for this unusual material. But that's actually not even the most exciting discovery from the past few months. The most exciting discovery is in regards to something that many different physicists, including the famous Richard Feynman, always believed to be kind of impossible. Essentially finding a way to generate energy from what's known as Brownian motion, from the motion of the particles themselves. If you remember from the chemistry class, Brownian motion is defined as this random activity of different atoms and different molecules, which essentially results in a completely impossible to predict um, motion of particles, something that for example increases as you increase temperature and decreases as the temperature drops closer and closer to the absolute zero. And naturally by itself, there is really no way for us to somehow generate work or energy out of this motion. Because it's unpredictable, because it's in every single direction, it's just kind of impossible to turn this into something useful. Which is of course something that most physicists believed for a very long time. But it looks like that particular belief might be broken now. Once again, due to a discovery that was made only a few weeks ago that you can also read more about in the paper in the description below. And this time, the scientists from University of Arkansas developed a very interesting circuit able to capture the Brownian motion of graphene and essentially turn it into electrical power. Not a lot of power, but power nonetheless. And as you can see in this animation from the Delft University of Technology, graphene is able to exhibit a lot of different types of motion. And some of this motion, even though technically it is Brownian motion, doesn't actually act like a typical gas or fluid. It's a lot more defined and a lot more predictable. And because it's only one single sheet, we can hypothetically create a very unique circuit that essentially captures the motion of graphene as it sort of wobbles back and forth and then generates energy based on this motion, which is essentially the simplification you're looking at right here. This circuit was able to generate power and create tiny amounts of current that hypothetically, if you were to scale it to large proportions, could actually provide relatively large amounts of energy by essentially using nothing but the Brownian motion itself. 
In other words, the only thing that's happening here is the natural oscillations of atoms. That's where the work is coming from. But because they're more orderly and because they sort of generate predictable motions, and also because graphene is electroconductive and is able to send electrons back and forth, the scientists in the study were able to definitively show that tiny, tiny amounts of current and voltage were produced when the graphene was just vibrating and essentially nothing else was affecting it. Now, because the amounts of current we're talking about were like in nanoampere and also nanovoltages, we're still not there yet where we can use this to, for example, power your house or, for example, provide free energy for your electric vehicle. But because tiny amounts of current can then become larger amounts of current if you use more graphene, one day we could actually use this to produce tremendous amounts of energy completely for free by using nothing but carbon itself. Which is kind of ironic because right now the biggest issue with a lot of electrical production is the excess of carbon that's produced and released into the atmosphere. So it's very possible that this is actually the solution we've been looking for. Finding a way to turn carbon back into graphene and then start creating energy that way. Now this is still really really sort of far in the future and also we don't even know if this is going to be an effective way to generate energy. But right now the scientists are proposing that their current discovery could hypothetically be used in some of these smaller devices, like for example powering something that requires a relatively small amount of current, such as maybe pacemakers or a lot of other tools where batteries cannot be replaced quite easily, but require a long-term functionality and relatively small amounts of current. And according to them, you could technically place approximately a million of these circuits in a tiny millimeter by millimeter square, and this would hypothetically provide just enough electricity to power some of the low power devices. But though the theory itself is definitely there and it does seem to make a lot of sense, the problem right now would be making that million circuits. Because when it comes to manufacturing massive amounts of graphene and especially creating these tiny circuits, we're still really really far from being able to do so effectively. As a matter of fact, using a tape right here might be the most effective way we have right now. And all of the graphene that was uh, created last year, for example, was only mostly used for research purposes. Only about $9 million worth of graphene was produced, and that's actually very, very little, considering that we would need so much more, thousands and actually millions times more, just to create a tiny little battery. So in that sense, this is still a very expensive and somewhat time-consuming process. Even though the theory is there and we can hypothetically produce infinite energy by just using Brownian motion of graphene, we just don't really know how to make it effectively just yet. And that's of course the next step and potentially the next Nobel Prize to be won by someone else who finds a very effective way of producing massive amounts of graphene that we can then use to create so many different tools. With hopefully the first such tool being an extremely effective space elevator where the elevator cable would be made from massive amounts of um, graphene. So far graphene seems to be the best candidate for creating such a device. Nevertheless, this is a super exciting discovery and will hopefully in the next few decades help humanity to overcome both the carbon excess problems and the energy problems we're going to be having in the next few decades. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about what seems to be the creation of the most accurate clock on the planet. The clock that's so accurate that even since the beginning of the universe, it would have only shifted by a few milliseconds. Which implies that it would take around a trillion years for this clock to be wrong by one second. But just in general, let's also talk about the history of timekeeping and how our timekeeping devices advanced throughout the last few centuries. And today we believe that keeping track of time or timekeeping most likely began with the Egyptians and the Babylonians around 5000 years ago. Babylonians, for example, had this really complex system of keeping track of time, which was mostly used for all sorts of communal activities, all sorts of public events, and to essentially schedule different things that related around trade and also harvesting and planting of various crops. And most of this was usually done using sundials, like this one right here, this is from Egypt, which would essentially create a shadow that could then be used to track time in the day, which was also connected to a larger calendar, which normally was some sort of a really complex star chart that involved observing the stars and measuring various dates, seasons, and so on. But since sundials only worked in the morning, the night alternative for this was the so-called water clock, 
This usually used the dripping water to try to mark certain periods of time in order to measure times at night as well. But as you can probably imagine, all of this was extremely inaccurate and it was relatively easy to make a mistake or possibly even have some sort of a major miscalculation in the dates, time and so on. I mean, for example, if you suddenly broke your water clock or if suddenly your sundial was stolen or disappeared, well, that means that you couldn't really keep track of time for quite a while. Now, at some point, the Egyptians and some other civilizations also started using the so-called hourglass, which was actually a very accurate way of keeping track of certain periods of time, but eventually even this wasn't really enough. But unfortunately for centuries, there really wasn't any new technology coming up until about um, early 1200s. In 13th century, in this particular place right here, known as the Dunstable Priory in England, we have the appearance of what seems to be the first ever mechanical clock. This was a weight-driven clock and were most likely used in this particular church to keep track of time when, for example, the preacher was delivering a sermon or during the practice of the choir. You can actually learn more about all of this in the article I'm posting in the description below. But within only a few decades after this, as the trade around Europe started to pick up, the need for timekeeping and the need for precise timekeeping, especially for, for example, keeping your shop open or for conducting other types of trades, created a major need for new types of clocks and a lot of accurate measurements. At this point, a lot of new clocks started to be developed by various artisans, and I think one of the most famous ones was probably this one right here in Prague. But interestingly, because all of them operated with a relatively similar mechanism where they actually used to strike a bell to announce certain time, the word for these devices became cloca, which is basically Latin for a bell. And that's of course why we call clocks clocks today. It's just because of the historical reference. But up until mid-1600s, all of the clocks were relatively inaccurate still. As a matter of fact, most of them would have a few minutes of difference after a single day. And so the need for precision became quite important, especially as we started to colonize and explore the world using relatively complex pathways across the oceans. In this case, clocks became paramount for navigation and for accuracy of knowing exactly where you were. Now, around 1637, the famous Galileo Galilei proposed the first ever pendulum clock, which was physically created by another astronomer, Christian Huygens only a few decades later, in 1656. And one of the reasons it was actually the astronomers that created these very relatively accurate clocks was because they were having trouble keeping track of objects in the night skies. Every single night, if you didn't have an accurate clock, the, you would actually not know what you were looking at the night before and you would have trouble finding the same star. Mostly because it was very difficult to know back then what time it was at night. And so both astronomers, and actually several other astronomers, spent a lot of time, actually decades, trying to develop a relatively accurate system of keeping track of time at night. And they essentially succeeded with the invention of the first pendulum clocks, which actually were relatively accurate up until approximately 150 years ago. So these were used for several hundred years. And so interestingly, it was on Christmas Day of 1656 when the first accurate pendulum clock became available to all of the astronomers and this, of course, was also the beginning of the age of precise observations of motions of different stars, comets, and so on across the night skies. And what's really amazing about this new discovery is that it was essentially at least a hundred and even up to a thousand times more accurate than any previous clock before that. So this was an extremely, extremely groundbreaking discovery for that particular age. And so even though before that the accuracy was about 15 minutes per day, Basically, a typical clock would either gain or lose about 15 minutes per day. We now had an accuracy that was around one minute per week. And that's actually a huge improvement, especially for astronomy. And eventually, as clocks became more popular and also as they became, in some sense, more attractive, they even would eventually turn into a required furniture in pretty much most of the houses. And that's of course how pretty much everyone back in the days used to have these so-called grandfather clocks. But with time the mechanisms became more and more complex and by early 1900s we had a very very accurate mechanism including this brilliant mechanism known as escapement and even certain parts that used partial vacuum. And so by 1900s pretty much most of the astronomical observatories had these really advanced pendulum clocks that had extremely complex parts on the inside. 
But around the same time, actually, even prior to this, we also started to discover other properties of other things, other materials. In this case, we discovered that so-called crystals of quartz were actually able to oscillate at an extremely precise frequency that could be used for certain things, for example, timekeeping. And so in 1927, the Bell Telephone Laboratories in Canada built the first official crystal quartz clock that was able to use this extremely new by then technology. These crystal clocks were extremely accurate. The error here was roughly around one second every two years or so. And so this clock was already accurate enough to be used by pretty much all of the industries on the planet. But interestingly, this technology didn't really last long. Within only a decade, we've discovered that we can also use atoms. And so in this picture right here, you see Jack Perry on the left and Louis Essen on the right, standing in front of the first ever cesium-133 atomic clock. The clock that's based on an extremely precise oscillation of cesium-133 atom that we've been able to calculate extremely accurate and that has also since become essentially a standard for a lot of different measurements. For example, the second today is described in terms of the oscillations of this particular atom. And what's even more interesting is that cesium oscillations are even used to calculate some of the other units, including meter, the unit of length. So in that sense, this is an extremely important discovery and helped us improve the accuracy of a lot of different measurements around the planet. That number or that oscillation is the number you see on the screen. And this is the number that we use for a lot of calculations today. As a matter of fact, most atomic clocks today use cesium-133 and this number to calculate all of the time around the planet. Every satellite that we use, every atomic clock on the planet, they all use this standard. And though since then we've had propositions of, for example, using pulsars or neutron stars for more precise time measurements, because in some sense they can actually be more precise than the cesium clock, and at least one paper even proposed using this white dwarf as the most accurate optical clock, it would still be much easier for us to just use cesium-133, mostly because it's readily available, and also because it's a lot easier to keep track of any kind of errors. With a white dwarf, especially if it's just a single object, it means that at some point when the Earth is spinning around, it would be invisible to some of the observers on the planet, and so in that sense it's not really the best solution. But the atomic clocks are still not perfectly accurate, mostly because when the light is emitted by the atom itself, it causes the atom to recoil just slightly, and because of this, it introduces tiny shifts of atoms and thus introduces these tiny mistakes that can add up with time. But what's the approximate accuracy here? Well, every few million years we expect an atomic clock to lose approximately one second. And the thing is, the scientists have been trying to improve all of this by, first of all, cooling down cesium atoms and making them stop moving so much, but that's still not really that accurate for scientific purposes. And in this case, the scientists were finally able to solve this issue by introducing a little bit of quantum mechanics. And so the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description below were able to create a really accurate cesium-133 clock by entangling several different atoms using lasers and using the phenomenon known as quantum entanglement. In other words, they were able to connect several atoms and make them act as one. And because of this, the tiny shifts of individual atoms can now become kind of averaged out, thus removing any errors that we previously had. And this new clock is basically the most accurate clock ever made. If it was operating since the beginning of the universe, so basically for the past 14 billion years, it would have only made approximately 0.1 second mistake. So that's about 100 milliseconds per 13 to maybe 14 billion years. And what's more is that this is a scalable technique. So in other words, by adding even more atoms and by adding more entanglement, we can make this clock even more accurate. And so in that sense, this is actually a completely new technique that allows us to measure time with such extreme precision that it would also allow us to recalculate a lot of different units and create some of the most precise measurements humanity has ever had. This of course includes things like seconds, but also things like units of measurements of length, of weight, and of course of energy. So in that sense, the accuracy here is completely mind-blowing. But what's interesting is that all of these advances, for the most part, have really been done to help us with different astronomical problems. Even though all of this started with, for example, Huygens and Galileo, 
who essentially just wanted to be able to observe comets and stars better, now we need this precision to be able to know exactly where satellites are in space, mostly because all of our satellite technology depends on extremely, extremely precise atomic clocks. Without having this precision, we actually will not be able to communicate or use any satellites. And this is of course yet another thing that astronomy is good for. It introduces these incredible concepts and incredible new techniques that are then used by everyone around the planet. But I guess for now that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video. I wanted to take you on this historical trip and explain to you how humanity used to keep track of time and what we can do now with these new extremely precise clocks. Once in a while I find a paper that has a really intriguing title. Water as a metal detected at Bassi 2. And this is generally when I get really excited and try to discover if this is actually something worth talking about. Hello wonderful person, today we're going to be discussing this right here. The study with a video right here that was literally able to turn water into a metal. But that is something I need to kind of explain in a little bit more detail. What's a metal? Now obviously from objects around us we sort of understand what metal is, but the word metal has many different definitions depending on the field you're talking about. And so for example in regular life a metal usually represents some sort of a substance that when prepared, polished or in some way fractured will usually have lustrous appearance and will usually conduct electricity and heat really well, while also generally being very malleable meaning that if you were to hammer it, you can actually turn it into any shape, with gold in this case being the most malleable metal of all. But it's also ductile, meaning that you can actually stretch it into some sort of a wire. Now, that's metal in daily life, but this doesn't actually tell us anything about the metal that was discovered in this paper, more importantly, it doesn't actually tell us about the idea of metals in other sciences. For example, when you hear about a metallic compound in physics or chemistry, that's not at all what they're talking about. As a matter of fact, 95 out of 118 elements in the periodic table are considered to be metals in terms of chemistry and physics. And so in this case, the definition itself is slightly different. Furthermore, it's different from the definition from astrophysics. In astrophysics, anything that's not hydrogen and helium is a metal. And that's something we've talked about on this channel many times. But this is not a definition we're using today. We're using the definition from physics. And the definition here is based on the structure of the atom of the element. In certain elements, if the outer shell of these elements is ready to lose its electrons, especially if the substance is solid or liquid, we refer to this as a metal. And because of this ability to lose electrons, that's why metals conduct electricity. So in some sense you can think of a metal as a highly conductive substance that conducts electricity pretty easily. And more specifically in physics, any substance that conducts electricity at absolute zero, or essentially minus 273 degrees uh, Celsius, is considered to be a metal. But the definition doesn't end there. For example, we know that in room conditions, sodium is a metal. But if you start increasing pressure at some point, it stops being a metal. So even though in room temperature certain elements are metals and certain are not, there's actually a way to modify their metallicity by changing either the pressure or the temperature or even both. And this is exactly why in certain planets, such as Jupiter, we actually start getting metallic components inside the planet. If you were to pressurize hydrogen, if you were to pressurize helium or methane, it will actually start conducting electricity and become metallic. And because of this, these planets get extremely powerful magnetospheres. Whereas on our planet, because the pressure and the temperature is not high enough, all of this is done by the very, very large iron core on the inside, which is still metallic at these temperatures and pressures. And so metal as a definition is sort of really broad. It does include a lot of different compounds we have on the planet. It also includes a lot of elements that we normally think of as non-metals, but more importantly, depending on the temperature and the pressure, something can become a metal or a metal can become a non-metal. And it all comes down to the ability to conduct electricity. Ok, but today we are talking about water as a metal. Now first of all, a quick side note, apparently this video and actually the study itself was by Philip Mason, who's also a relatively famous YouTuber who also made a video about this and his channel is known as Thunderfoot. Totally not related to this video or the topic, but just something that I wanted to mention. Anyway, water as a metal. Now first of all, water is obviously not an element. Water, just like carbon dioxide, is a chemical compound. 
or essentially a substance that contains several elements on the inside. But by itself, it's still not really a metal. It does not conduct electricity. And this is of course something you might remember from your chemistry class. Pure water does not conduct electricity. Okay, but why is it that you can actually get electrocuted if stepping on a wet puddle that's connected to a life cable? Well, actually, in this case, the electricity is not conducted by water. Water is a really good solvent. It dissolves a lot of things. And so when it ends up dissolving salt, salt creates a lot of different charged ions, which then, in a sense, act like metals. They actually conduct the electricity with the water itself doing basically nothing. So in this case, the water is not the conductor. It's the salt inside. And so when only a small amount of ions is present in the water, and suddenly a part of a human body is introduced into the water containing these ions, because human body is a better conductor, all this electricity then starts flowing through your body and, well, basically electrocutes the person. However, if you were to increase the amount of salt in the water, such as, for example, in the ocean water, it then becomes almost impossible to get electrocuted by this. The ions on the inside will conduct the electricity so well that any electricity passing through the water will actually never really reach your body. Your body in this case sort of starts acting almost like an insulator. Anyway, totally off topic, not really what we're talking about, but just a fun fact. So when it comes to pure water, it's not a metal, it does not conduct electricity by itself. Unless you pressurize the water. If you were to create ridiculously high pressures, such as the ones found inside Jupiter, then you end up squeezing the molecules so much that the atoms do start to act as conductors. It then does become metallic. This is something we believe happens inside many different planets that are massive enough. And for water, this pressure has to be approximately 48 million bar. That's a lot of pressure. But turns out there's also a way to create metallic water without really high pressures and without high temperatures. And this is pretty much exactly what this image right here shows. Metallic water. Water that became conductive after something was done to it. Something that was recently achieved at Bessie 2, a chemistry research facility located in Germany. And in this case, it was an experiment involving an alkali metal. Here they used an alloy of sodium and potassium. But you might have seen experiments with sodium and potassium before. You might already know what happens to these metals when you place them in water. They tend to have a really dramatic reaction, including actual fire and usually some sort of an explosion. And because of this, any experiment involving sodium, potassium or other alkali metals has always been somewhat on the dangerous side. Which is also one of the main reasons why nobody has ever discovered what exactly happens to water when you actually add alkali metals to them at that specific moment. But in this case, as you see in this video, the experimenter is going to be adding potassium to the water, making it explode as a result. But the scientists in Germany decided to do it differently. They took the potassium uh, sodium alloy and added a lot of water vapor that started to form really, really thin film around the surface of the droplet. And as you can see in this beautiful video, the droplet starts to change colors and actually becomes golden. This unusual golden film on the droplet, that's metallic water. Which is really amazing, because it looks like when you turn water into a metal, it becomes golden in color. And that's something nobody expected. But what exactly happens here to make water metallic? Well, right now the scientists think that it's because of the electrons escaping from the sodium-potassium alloy, which end up dissolving in the water and thus turning the water metallic, forcing the electrons in water molecules to start conducting electricity. And this phase transition from insulating water to metallic water for some reason also turns water golden in color. Now that's something that we can't really explain right now, but it's something that I'm sure someone will try to explain in some of the future studies. And it stays this way for at least a few seconds. Now obviously we don't really know what happens after, but I'm sure once again it will be investigated in future studies. With the other discovery of course being the fact that we can actually avoid the explosions between alkali metals and water. And we can avoid this by doing what they did. By adding the water vapor instead of the actual water to the alkali metals, thus producing the chemical reaction. And so overall, definitely a really cool experiment, definitely a really cool discovery, but is it going to have any practical use? Well, that's not a question I can answer right now. This is a completely brand new discovery. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a somewhat unusual and currently unexplained detection coming from an entirely new system that's supposed to detect high-frequency gravitational waves. 
the types of ways we've talked about previously many, many times. But this time it's something different and something really difficult to explain. So let's talk a little bit more about this, starting with the idea of what creates these waves to begin with. So since 2015, since the original detection from the LIGO observatory that was able to confirm the collision between two black holes, we now have detected quite a lot. We've detected collisions between neutron stars, between black hole and neutron stars, and some collisions that even today do not have a good explanation. But all of these concepts come from the initial propositions by Albert Einstein, the propositions involving extremely massive and usually very dense bodies that can be so powerful that they even start to oscillate or create these wave formations in space-time itself. Something that we do not sense, but something that we can detect by using very specialized detection devices. And obviously the most famous such device is the LIGO detector. The way it operates is relatively simple. It contains these 4 km long laser lines that shine a light at exactly the same spot. But if something somehow contracts the space-time between these lasers, we'll start detecting various interferences in this part of the device, which can then be interpreted as the potential gravitational detection. In this case, a gravitational wave detection. And since 2015, many such detections have been confirmed, and many such discoveries have allowed us to understand that the universe is full of these different collisions. But LIGO unfortunately is limited to the types of frequencies it can detect. At the moment, it's only able to detect frequencies of anywhere between 10 Hz and about 10,000 Hz, which usually corresponds to the collision between solar mass black holes, neutron stars, and so on. But for more massive collisions, such as between two supermassive black holes, we would have to have something entirely different. Unfortunately, LIGO is not able to detect those. Some of the previous studies using pulsar detections have actually been able to identify potential collisions between supermassive black holes and extremely low frequency waves, but none of this has been confirmed so far. The thing is, what about smaller objects? What about some exotic objects such as low mass dense objects or possibly primordial black holes? Black holes that could be a mass of planet Earth or even the mass of the Moon. And this is where this other concept comes into play. Ultra high frequency gravitational waves something that actually has a potential for being an incredible technology. So, okay, quick side note. There are actually several really interesting papers out there, with one included in the description below, that suggest we can technically use these high-frequency gravitational waves as a very effective way to communicate across really far away distances without anything blocking the communication, simply because gravitational waves tend to pass through everything. As a matter of fact, even though technically SETI usually focuses on electromagnetic spectrum in order to find some kind of extraterrestrial intelligence, it's way more likely that a super advanced civilization would probably use gravitational waves and high frequency gravitational waves for long distance communication. Even though it requires a lot of energy initially, it's a lot more efficient at producing information that doesn't actually disappear over time and is also visible from pretty far away. Anyway, side note, but a very interesting side note, because this could potentially lead to completely new technologies. And so at the moment there is quite a lot of interest in trying to create devices able to detect high frequency, so basically over 10 kHz frequencies of gravitational waves. These detectors already sort of exist, and they generally operate on a somewhat similar principle to what we sometimes have inside the watches we have on our hand. They use crystal oscillators, with the actual detectors in this case being pretty small, but they do require a lot of setup around them in order to basically disregard any additional interference that could be coming from something else. And this new study, as well as the new detector, comes from the Australian ARC Center of Excellence for Dark Matter Particle Physics, or basically the center that's trying to discover particles responsible for dark matter exotic particles, unusual particles, but particles that would be a lot less massive than a typical black hole. And so they created a device that uses the oscillations of quartz, and specifically these quartz crystal disks you see right here, that usually vibrate at high frequencies, to create a device that's able to tell when something interferes with their oscillations. Kind of similar to how LIGO works, but on a much smaller scale. Although unlike LIGO that uses lasers, in this case they used acoustic waves. And so generally when it comes to crystal oscillations, they will basically vibrate at a very specific frequency if electricity is passed through them. This is normally referred to as the piezoelectric effect, and there are a lot of different tools around us today that use this for one reason or another. 
A lot of these devices are known as bulk acoustic wave devices are actually used in a lot of telecommunication technology as well, including your smartphones. But in this case, this was connected to something else, an extremely sensitive amplifier they refer to as squid, with all of this then placed behind several radiation shields in order to prevent interference. Would all of this also cool down to very low temperatures in order to increase the energy acoustic vibrations from the quartz? And they ran this for approximately 153 days and performed two different experimental runs. And surprisingly to the scientists, in these first 153 days, it detected two unusual signals that currently do not have a very good explanation. Both signals suggesting some sort of a high frequency gravitational wave effect or possibly something different, possibly something entirely different. Now, first of all, both of these detections were relatively strong compared to the background radiation. Both of them suggested that something might have happened in these frequencies. With frequencies in this case being approximately 5.5 MHz up to about 8.4 MHz. So these are much higher frequencies than what we usually detect from LIGO, where the frequencies are normally around 10 kHz. And so both of these unusual detections right now have several potential explanations, but nothing conclusive just yet. Obviously, the most exciting potential explanation is that maybe it's the detection of somewhat less massive primordial black holes colliding together. In this case, their mass would be probably just a few masses of the moon, maybe mass of planet Earth. Although all of this will depend on the actual distance, so it's not really certain yet. But at the same time, this could be maybe produced by some sort of a charged particle or something else passing through the region where the device was operating. So at the moment, the gravitational waves are not the only explanation. In this case, it can also be due to some sort of a stress buildup inside the crystal or inside the device itself. Maybe this was just due to the release of the stress that suddenly created these unusual vibrations detectable twice throughout 150 days. On the other hand, it could also be due to some sort of an explosion, such as a meteor or some sort of a bolide exploding in the air, which actually would be really interesting to find out, because maybe this is how we can detect more of these events, by using similar techniques and similar devices. So at the moment, it's not really certain. But this could also be some sort of an atomic internal reaction, with just the atoms rearranging or something else happening on the atomic scale. Or, the scientists are really hoping for this particular answer, it could be the detection of some sort of a dark matter particle, or possibly some sort of a candidate that we've been trying to find for many years now. And there are quite a lot of potential explanations here as well. WIMPs, axions, or a lot of other hypothetical particles that have been proposed for many years now. With dark matter or primordial black holes being the most exciting explanations for these particular detection events. But I guess the important part about all of this is that this device seems to work. It seems to detect something, and it does so really well. The scientists will obviously now try to focus on trying to identify exactly what they found, and one of the ways we can actually detect if this is, for example, let's just say a gravitational wave versus a meteor, is by taking the same device and putting it somewhere else on the planet. If this is a meteor, we'll know that the detection from the other device is going to be much, much weaker. And by using several devices, we'll also be able to triangulate where it came from. But if this is a gravitational wave coming from a primordial black hole, in this case, the actual effects will be extremely similar, only delayed by the distance, by the speed of light. And so by combining this particular device with possibly several copies and even several other detectors, such as, for example, a muon detector that's able to sense various cosmic particles coming from various directions, it will take this device and the ability to detect these high frequency waves to a completely new level and potentially might even help us eavesdrop on someone using the gravitational waves to communicate. But that's obviously an extremely big if. The more important part of the study right now is creating a device that's able to listen to these high frequency gravitational waves. But what we'll discover right now is a huge mystery. And though yes, it could be some sort of an alien civilization using extraterrestrial technology, but it could also be some new incredible discoveries when it comes to exotic particles, exotic bodies, or various poorly understood phenomena that we know very little about. And so creation of this device will most likely take us to a completely new level of understanding of space sciences. But I guess until further studies and further discoveries, that's all we know for now. We know something was discovered, as a matter of fact it was found twice, but what it is, nobody really knows right now. It's a mystery, a mystery we'll talk about in some of the future videos.
Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about water. Because something unusual, something extremely extraordinary has been recently discovered about water itself. And we're not talking about ice water or water in some strange states, we're talking about liquid water, the water that's present on the planet. And what recently has been discovered suggests that water itself seems to possess two different states depending on the temperature. And that is something that nobody really expected to find. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Because as you can probably imagine, water is probably one of the most important substances for life at least on planet Earth. And this is something that we actually need to understand really well if we do one day want to discover some kind of other life somewhere out there in order to understand the origins of life and of course how life evolved on planet Earth. So first of all, we know that water is already kind of strange. And by the way, when I say water, I don't mean just liquid water. I mean water itself as a molecule and as an element on the periodic table of elements. For example, this is the only known substance to us where the solid state, the ice as it's known, actually floats on the liquid state. In pretty much every other known case, the liquid state normally floats on top of the solid state. So this is, for example, the case with things like methane, ethane, and so on. But for some unknown to us reasons, in case of water, the ice is, well, it's less dense. It seems to be able to float on the surface of the liquid state of water. Now, obviously, this is something we've all learned in school and something we kind of all take for granted. But with other liquids, this is not the case at all. For some reason, the liquid water, when it freezes, when it becomes solid, starts to expand. And this is not really easy to explain. Also, when it comes to things like boiling or essentially becoming gas, normally the more molecular weight the molecule has, the higher its boiling point. So for water in this case, we would expect it to have much, much lower boiling point. But its boiling point is extremely high, suggesting that it has much stronger bonds than some of the other molecules. But that's of course some of the things that you might have already learned in school and some of the things that you might already understand because we know that overall water does seem to be a very strange substance. But these strange facts about water is not really something we can answer right now. There's still a lot of things we don't understand about the substance. There are however things that we've all learned in school, which is of course the states of matter, the states of water. We probably all still remember that we are taught that water has three states, ice, liquid water and gas. And in this case, you can actually see two of them. You see the clouds above and you see the liquid water, which is the ocean here. But what they didn't teach us in school is that water actually has a lot more states, way, way more than we can actually list in this video. For example, we've already discovered close to 20 different states of ice, basically the solid form. And they all seem to be different depending on the structure of the molecules inside the ice itself. For example, this form right here, known as ice 10, forms at really, really high pressures and creates a somewhat interesting, very symmetric ice compared to normal ice we see on Earth. And most of these ice forms are normally formed in usually somewhat extreme conditions or in many cases in outer space. So for example, ice we find on comets or on other planetary objects structurally and possibly even functionally is not really the same ice as we have here on Earth. The ice on Earth is very unique and very different from the things we find in outer space. And these different forms of ice have been discovered for many, many years now, and we're probably going to be discovering a lot more of them in the future. But in this case, this is not particularly difficult to explain. As the water solidifies, as it becomes solid, water molecules can actually assume different types of shapes. Like not so long ago, only a couple of years ago, the Japanese scientists discovered that water can actually create this extremely light type of ice, the so-called ultra-density ice that the scientists also refer to as aero ice, mostly because it's very, very light compared to the typical ice we find on planet Earth. But that's for ices. On the opposite side of the spectrum, if we start warming up the water and if we make it extremely hot and extremely energized, we can also create what's known as plasma water. And we've discovered at least one potential planet where the atmosphere might be filled with this plasma water. And this is water that's essentially more closer to fire than it is to actual substance, to actual water. And so there are a lot of these extreme examples to show you that water has a lot of different states, many of which are obviously not taught in schools. But here's the thing though. What about the liquid water? turns out that even the liquid water is extremely surprising and completely unexpected in what it can do. It turns out that the liquid water on our planet has two states. And this is something we had no idea existed until, well, basically only a few months ago. 
because all of this came from this particular study you can find in the description below. And turns out all of this starts happening as you start warming up the water, somewhere between 40 and 60 degrees Celsius or 104 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the water starts acquiring these unusual properties it did not have when it was colder. It literally starts switching between two different liquid states, and both liquid states, the colder water and the warmer water, have very different physical properties that can be calculated, measured, and can most likely affect other systems around them. And all of this starts happening as soon as water reaches that temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius. So first of all, around 50 degrees Celsius, the refraction of water, the refractive index as it's known, changes to the point where it becomes observable. Refraction in this case refers to the property of various substances where they actually change the angle of incoming light when the light goes from one medium to another. And it looks like at around 50 degrees Celsius the refractive index of liquid water changes as well, as if it became something a little bit different from what it used to be. And then, around 53 degrees Celsius, it starts to also change its conductivity. And although normally conductivity in water can be changed by adding, for example, different salts, in this case we're talking about pure water. And the pure water also changes conductivity once it reaches a certain temperature, around 53 degrees in this case. Now, one property of water that's very unusual and also kind of hard to explain is the so-called surface tension. It's basically how strong the molecules hold on to each other, to create a kind of a, almost like a film on top of the water. It's not really a true film, but it's what we refer to as the surface tension. And this also changes, quite surprisingly, around the temperature of about 57 degrees. And although in this case maybe that's something to do with the fact that there's now more energy in the water because of the heat, it still is extremely difficult to explain. And then, around 64 degrees Celsius, it finally changes the last property, which is thermal conductivity. So in other words, by the time it reaches that 64 degree mark, it has changed at least four different properties, in some sense almost like becoming a completely different substance from what it used to be when it was colder. It practically becomes a different liquid. And this is not something anyone expected, this is not something the scientists actually were expecting to discover at all, but most importantly this has huge implications on life and also evolution of life. Remember, today we believe that life on Earth evolved approximately three and a half, maybe even four billion years ago. And this is when Earth was very different, it was a lot warmer, the water was also a lot warmer, and chances are it was actually much warmer than possibly even 64 degrees Celsius. In other words, the liquid water that was present on early Earth was very, very likely in that other state we just kind of discovered. The thermal conductivity, the electrical conductivity, refractive index, and surface tension were most likely a lot different from what they are today. And in some sense, maybe this is actually what helped life to evolve. We obviously can't really explain what exactly it was that helped life to evolve, but it does seem like maybe this actually has some sort of a correlation. The different state of liquid water present on early Earth may have assisted early life on Earth to create all of the necessary components for later life to evolve. Now this is not something we can easily prove just yet, but there is definitely a lot of implications in this discovery. And although we don't really have any good explanations yet, the potential explanation here is really all to do with the unusual bond that water uses to essentially maintain its shape. The bond we refer to as the hydrogen bond. And because this bond is used by so many other organic molecules, including things like proteins, and because it's so extremely important in regulation and maintenance of activity inside the living cells, for example, this of course also suggests that whatever was happening on early Earth when water was warmer was probably extremely different from what's happening on Earth today. And so now it's actually super important to take into consideration the temperature of liquid water on potential other objects we discover somewhere out there. Because water seems to have very different effects in very different temperatures, all of this officially has now become even more complicated than before. But what's really interesting here is that we keep discovering all of these incredible things about water and we keep realizing how absolutely incredible this substance is. It seems to be absolutely unique in the universe, in all of its properties, in all of its abilities, but most importantly of course, in its ability to create organic life and to sustain it for many many billions of years. And this is of course one of the many reasons we're studying all of this, because we want to understand how life was created, how life evolved, and what exactly was the role of water in all of this. But anyway, 
It's a really, really exciting discovery, probably one of the bigger discoveries of the last two years. But the implications of this discovery are not really going to be instantly apparent to us. It's probably going to take a lot of studies and a lot of new discoveries to try to figure out what all of this means. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and you're looking at a typical ring galaxy. This one is actually very well known, this is known as the Hoogs object. But even today, we still don't really know how these objects came to be. Their origin is a bit of a mystery. But wait, don't leave yet, because we're not really talking about ring galaxies. We're talking about wormholes, because at least one paper out there proposes that these galaxies were probably created through the formation of different wormholes across the universe. So yeah, we're going to be talking about a very theoretical but also somewhat intriguing paper. The paper that, as always, you can find in the description below, and the paper that I discovered while doing research on the newly discovered mysterious objects known as odd radio circles. And so let's discuss this in a little bit more detail because even though it is theoretical, it still is interesting and could actually make sense. And let's start with the theory. The theory behind wormholes is pretty solid. Theoretically and mathematically, we do believe that they can exist and possibly do exist. And all of the theoretical explanations about wormholes start with the Einstein's predictions in regards to space-time itself, with wormholes being a kind of a shortcut or a connection between two different points of space-time. Now in his theories he predicted the idea behind black holes and the idea behind white holes. And although we've confirmed one of his ideas, the black holes, the white holes have never really been found and nothing we've seen in the universe so far has in any way resembled any of the predictions of what white holes should look like. Nevertheless, we still understand that space-time can be stretched, it can also be bent, it can be twisted, and it can technically connect to different points. For example, this image right here shows you the famous prediction from 1935 of what Einstein and another physicist by the name of Nathan Rosen proposed could be possible between two different sheets of space-time. They could hypothetically connect to one another and create a kind of a hole in between. This is also sometimes referred to as the Einstein-Rosen bridge. And here a typical wormhole would contain two different mouths and one throat. You kind of hypothetically go through the throat to get from one mouth to the other. The mouth itself, just like in Interstellar, would not really be a hole but a 3D sphere. The sphere would be the hole, because you know in three dimensions a hole is actually a sphere. Once you go through one sphere, you come out on the other side. But the natural question here is of course, can we go through a wormhole and obviously do they exist and do things go through them to begin with? And this is kind of where we come to the point where the mathematics and the physics don't really agree with what we want to believe and with the science fiction we get to see in the movies. So for example, mathematically or in terms of physics, in order for a wormhole to stay open, it needs to somehow prevent the gravity from shutting the wormhole down. Now, theoretically, we believe that wormholes may have actually existed in the early universe, especially as the universe started to expand very suddenly. But it's also possible that all of these mouths, all of these wormholes, have actually been closed a long time ago by the forces of gravity. In other words, something has to act on the actual throat of the wormhole in order to prevent it from shutting down and from essentially closing permanently. But is there anything that can keep the wormhole from closing down and from shutting down permanently? Well, in theory, mathematically speaking, negative energy is one such thing that can try to resist gravity from shutting down the wormhole. In other words, certain types of exotic energy and exotic matter could hypothetically prevent a wormhole from shutting down. But a lot of this exotic stuff only exists on paper. Most of it has never been produced. And the idea of negative energy, well, it theoretically is possible, as a matter of fact, one type of negative energy is what we believe dark energy is. So that strange energy that exists in a universe that seems to cause it to expand faster and faster is one type of negative energy. We kind of think we understand it, at least mathematically, but we obviously have no idea if it can actually go inside a wormhole and prevent it from shutting down. Theoretically, obviously, it's possible. As a matter of fact, theoretically, it's possible that the universe has been doing this for billions of years. We just don't really have any physical proof of any of this. In other words, we don't really know if this negative energy can indeed prevent a wormhole from shining down. 
But we do know that if they do exist, there should be ways for us to detect the effects around this wormhole and thus prove its existence that way. Now, interestingly, if you were to go on Archive or really any other scientific website and look up wormholes, you'll find thousands of scientific studies on the topic. As a matter of fact, it seems like every week there's a new study either describing what a wormhole could be or how we can find them, or even studies trying to prove that we've already detected them, just never really realized that we're looking at a wormhole. For example, there are several studies that suggest that the object in the middle of our own galaxy, the object known as Sagittarius A star, could hypothetically be a wormhole. And there are actually very specific ways we can establish if it's a wormhole or a black hole. But at the moment, we can't really discover which one it is yet because a wormhole would have slightly different gravitational effects on the nearby stars. So by watching these stars that you can see right here for much longer periods, we'll actually be able to establish which one it is. Is it a black hole or a wormhole? For now, most people agree that it's most likely a massive black hole. Nevertheless, because mathematically and physically it can totally exist, for many years now, various scientists have been trying to discover any kind of a proof for the existence of these unusual and somewhat mysterious but also super exciting objects. And although mathematically they're definitely possible, and physically they can definitely exist, it seems that discovering them has been extremely challenging and also trying to maintain their existence even in theory is also not very easy. Which I guess takes us to this new paper from the Russian scientists that suggests that, well, maybe, just maybe, the wormholes are actually created in the middle of these unusual galaxies known as ring galaxies. And also, maybe, just maybe, we've also seen the signs of these wormholes, or at least the interaction of these wormholes, very recently. Which in some sense actually connects two different mysteries and tries to resolve both of them at the same time. So, as I mentioned before, ring galaxies, like the hoax object here, don't really have a very clear origin. We know they exist, we know they are absolutely beautiful, and we know there is a lot of them out there. And some of them have really unusual and really difficult to explain shapes, yet others, like the famous Hoax object, seem to even have a ring galaxy inside of them. Although technically, this other smaller galaxy is not just inside, it's much much farther away simply because of the redshift that it's exhibiting. But these unusual galaxies still don't really have a very good explanation for how they were formed. And they also seem to exhibit certain properties that are still not very well explained either. And when we find something mysterious in the universe, there are going to be naturally a lot of interesting explanations. One such explanation is that maybe, just maybe, these ring galaxies formed around a very massive wormhole that either existed in the past or even still exists there today. And the scientists in this paper explain that essentially by having a wormhole and certain effects of this wormhole right at the center, it would then force the matter around itself to form in such a way that it would actually form a ring. What's more is that they also suggest that sometimes when this matter falls into this wormhole, it's obviously going to collide with some of the other matter on the other side, as it's probably falling into the second mouth on the other side. But the thing is, at some point, some of this matter will collide and produce a tremendous amount of gamma rays and a lot of other radiation, which will seem like it's emanating from the center of this particular galaxy or from essentially the center of the wormhole. Now, we know that black holes can definitely produce gamma rays, but we also know that for a typical black hole, the energy released is going to be in a kind of a point form. It's going to be these two jets emanating from both directions. And that's because of the way that the black hole and the accretion disk essentially entangle everything using the magnetic lines and cause them to be released in two different directions. But unlike a typical supermassive black hole, a wormhole is not going to produce jets, but is instead going to produce a sphere of gamma ray emissions or a sphere of very very powerful emissions of some other sort. So in other words, it's going to look sort of like a spherical bubble. A bubble around a relatively massive object in the middle. Now, this is one of the explanations for how these rings were formed, but what's more interesting is that this is how the scientists in this paper also explain the mysterious odd radio circles, also known as orcs, that were only discovered less than a year ago from when I'm making this video. You can learn about them in one of the videos somewhere right there. And so the scientists here are trying to basically solve the mystery of why orcs exist and essentially explain it as the emissions from these wormholes that probably exist in the center, but also explain how the ring galaxies formed as well. And furthermore, they also explain that a lot of these ring galaxies only formed because of the wormholes in the middle. Basically here, the wormhole, or the actual mouth of the wormhole, 
provides the gravitational foundation for the formation of everything else in this galaxy. And because of this, the scientists also mentioned that they don't think that there's going to be a very large dark matter halo here. In other words, the matter here is going to be mostly visible, there's going to be practically no dark matter. And all of these propositions, at least at the moment and at least mathematically, are not really that far-fetched. There's obviously no physical proof of the, any of this just yet, and there are obviously other explanations that can be used to maybe explain all of this, but it's still a proposition that's worth investigating. Especially since wormholes and white holes are actually a predicted phenomenon in Einstein's theories, and black holes have already been proven and even found to exist physically. But there is, however, an important uh, side note here. It does not mean that if these wormholes exist, we can start traveling across them. Because mathematically and theoretically, any regular matter passing through a wormhole can actually completely shut it down, destabilizing everything in between and basically making it not exist anymore. So theoretically at least, there is probably still no way for us humans and our spaceships to travel through these wormholes and to go from one location to another. But despite all of this, it's still really, really important for us to study these objects even in theory. And there's one really important reason for this. Today the physicists have been trying to figure out the so-called theory of everything. The theory that can connect all of the different physics in basically one single topic. More importantly, they've been trying to find a way to connect the quantum mechanics to the theories of Einstein and the theories of gravity. So far, no such theory exists. But we know that the idea of wormholes to some extent connects to the idea of quantum teleportation that has already been achieved in the lab. Which means that there is a way for us to theoretically connect quantum mechanics and quantum teleportation to the gravitational theories related to wormholes and space-time travel. And most of this is because the quantum teleportation that has been achieved in the lab works in a very similar way to how mathematically we think a typical wormhole would transfer information as well. And so in that sense, by studying wormholes and by studying the effects of gravity in the wormholes, and obviously by trying to find them somewhere out there and possibly even finding one somewhere out there, we might one day be able to create this theory of everything and finally understand how the universe works. For now though, it's definitely a very interesting proposition and it's also a pretty interesting idea to begin with. If the ideas that these scientists propose have any merit, it means that we can actually solve a lot of mysteries with a single explanation. But for now, we definitely need more studies, we need more investigations, and we obviously need a lot more observations of various galaxies and various unusual phenomena out there. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about ice. But things about ice you probably didn't know, and types of ice you may have never heard of before. We're still going to be talking about water ice, but different type of water ice extraterrestrial water ice. So let's discuss some of these new discoveries, including the most recent study that just found yet another type of ice we didn't know existed. And let's start with the idea of ice, water ice. So here on planet Earth, when liquid water reaches a certain temperature, it starts to freeze into a solid, becoming what we call ice. And as you probably know by now, we've been finding water, and specifically water ice, in a lot of different places around the galaxy and even around the universe. Here in our home in the solar system, ice seems to be abundant, and it seems to be pretty much everywhere. For example, water ice has been discovered in the darkest places on Mercury, which is very close to the sun, and nobody really expected to find any water ice here. We also obviously have water ice located right here, one of the poles of planet Mars. And just generally, in pretty much most of the locations around the solar system, most of the objects in the Oort cloud, most of the objects in any region of the solar system are going to have at least some water ice in them. And even beyond the solar system, we've discovered the interstellar ice also pretty much everywhere. But is it the same type of ice that we are used to? Is it the same type of ice that we have here on Earth? And the answer to that is, not really. As a matter of fact, it's very different. It's still water, and it's still ice, but just very different in structure and in properties. And all of this usually depends on what conditions this water ice is made in. For example, is it produced under a lot of pressure, no pressure, or same pressure as on Earth? Is it produced really quickly or really slowly? Are there any other types of radiation involved here? 
And essentially all of this depends on how the atoms and how the molecules themselves start to arrange and what sort of shapes they start to create. Now, for the ice we're used to, the one that's on Earth, if you were to really zoom into the structure of this ice, you would discover something that creates these very beautiful hexagonal shapes that is generally produced as this water molecule starts to arrange itself in these hexagonal shapes based on the arrangement of the oxygen atoms, with the hydrogen atom being more disorderly and more or less forming amorphous shapes and not really having any order at all. And so these hexagonal shapes are generally formed because of the oxygen arrangement with molecules connecting to one another using electrostatic forces, but with hydrogen atoms not really having as much of a structure or as much of a dependence on one another. And because of this, scientists sometimes refer to ice on Earth as hydrogen disordered ice. So the only order present in those crystals is based on the oxygen molecules, nothing else. Which surprisingly allows this type of ice to have very unique properties, properties that scientists believe were absolutely crucial for the development of life on the planet. But first of all, because of this hexagonal formation, that's why a lot of ice crystals, and specifically things like snowflakes, start to produce various beautiful six-sided patterns. And so all of this is based on the idea of a six-sided structure that's formed by the oxygen atoms. And because inside this type of ice only oxygen and not hydrogen have any order, one of the major properties of ice on Earth is that it can actually kind of flow. That's for example why a glacier is able to slowly flow down the mountain instead of just crumbling and falling apart like a typical crystal would. And so this hydrogen disorder is absolutely crucial for the properties of ice on Earth, or ice 1 as it's known in science. So this ice 1 surprisingly is unique to planet Earth. At least for now, we haven't been able to discover it in a lot of other places. But there is a lot of other ice, and it's definitely not the same as the ice on planet Earth. The ice on other objects and other planets and other dwarf planets like Pluto will actually be in some way different, usually more orderly. Or in this case, even the hydrogen atoms will start stacking in such a way that they create very specific orderly crystals. Although in some cases, it's actually quite the opposite. In some cases, we also have something known as amorphous ice, which has no order whatsoever and literally just easily flows across everything. And so officially, there were actually 18 different types of ices. Everything from ice 1 up until ice 18. With ice 18 being this really strange type of water known as super ionic water, where first the water molecules break apart and oxygen becomes ionized, then starts forming a very specific structure, but the hydrogen atoms stay around and kind of form this unusual, freely flowing structure on the inside. And although here on Earth we can usually only produce these in the lab using really extreme pressures, a lot of scientists today believe that a lot of this ice exists in objects like Neptune and Uranus because they do have a lot of strange ionic water on the inside. So this type of ice does definitely exist somewhere out there in the solar system. But generally, a lot of other types of ice that exist out there differ from one another because they can form hydrogen bonds in a very specific, very unique way. And this creates ice that's extremely brittle. It breaks really easily. Now, it's very difficult to kind of imagine this, but in some way, imagine ice that instead of just kind of slowly flowing in your hand, ends up cracking and breaking and kind of turning into dust almost immediately. And generally, the structure of each of these ices, and of course the properties of each of these ices, are going to be very different. With most of them being very mysterious because only tiny amounts of them have so far been produced in a typical lab environment. But now, only a few weeks ago from when I'm making this video, a team of scientists was able to create another type of ice. The ice we refer to as ice 19. With a general structure that kind of looks like this, where hydrogen is also just as ordered as oxygen. Or more scientifically speaking, instead of a hexagonal ice we find on Earth, the normal ice we are used to, this is a tetragonal crystalline phase that can only form in very special conditions, very cold temperatures and also very very high pressures. In this particular case, the scientists were able to create this using another form of ice known as ice 15 and then cooling this down to about minus 170 degrees Celsius and increasing the pressure to about 20,000 atmospheres. Which, by the way, is also something we find inside planets like Neptune and Uranus. These conditions, especially inside Uranus, which is slightly cooler, are pretty common all over the planet. But what's interesting in this particular discovery is that the scientists were also able to connect 
and in some cases relate several different types of ice, realizing that they only differ in terms of the location of hydrogen atoms, not the oxygen atoms. And specifically, I6, 15, and 19 are very, very similar to each other, but the hydrogen atoms are arranged a little bit differently. Although the natural assumption here is that they will also probably have different properties. They have a relatively similar density, not exactly the same though, but the properties, or basically how the ice reacts to the environment around itself, are going to be very different. Obviously, we don't really know what they are yet, but they're different. Also, original ice that all of this is made from, which is I6, can actually be formed in uh, normal temperature, but it still has to be at very high pressures. Or in this particular case, it has to be about minus 3 degrees Celsius with about 1.1 gigapascal of pressure, or about 11,000 times more pressure than on the surface of planet Earth. Pressures which usually exist inside various gas giants, but are very unlikely to exist on the surface of a terrestrial planet or a dwarf planet. And one of the more interesting implications from the study is that it seems that this polymorphous ice can transition from one phase to another naturally depending on the pressure. And that's of course something that we kind of expect to very likely happen inside of these very very large gas giants, specifically places like Uranus. Here the pressures are very high, the temperatures are super low, and a lot of the atmosphere always circulates stuff around on the inside, so a lot of water that's present here most likely goes through these transitions all the time. But how it affects the actual planet and what happens on the inside, that's a mystery we have no answer to. With I guess the biggest mystery here being, can you actually form some sort of a maybe Earth-like life based on the ice and water present in these conditions? Because right now, what all of this implies is that the ice and the water on Earth are very unique, and that's maybe why life exists here, but does it exist on other places like Enceladus, Titan, and so on? And so all of this water that forms the surface of Enceladus, for example, all of this ice you see here, that's very different from the ice on Earth. It's not entirely clear what type of ice this is, but it definitely has different properties, different action, and of course different interaction with everything around it compared to what we have on Earth. And so various types of water we discover around the universe, all of this really depends on the structure itself, the structure of the molecules as they crystallize. But more specifically, all of this really depends on the structure of hydrogen atoms. How the hydrogen atoms align seems to determine what sort of ice we get at the end. And when they align randomly, we get the ice we get on planet Earth. And all this is of course really important in order for us to understand what happens on these various objects in the solar system and beyond. The majority of these objects, including the one you see right here, the moon Europa, are not made of the water ice from planet Earth. This is also this polymorphous ice we are able to create in the lab, but that doesn't exist on Earth. Although, okay, not entirely true. There's one type of ice that exists on Earth that possibly also exists in space, and that's the Type 7 ice. The type of water ice that occasionally finds itself inside different diamonds produced in extreme pressures inside planet Earth. Those conditions do create polymorphous ice in tiny, tiny amounts inside diamonds. But in outer space, the so-called hexagonal ice, the ice we're used to, is almost non-existent. Most of the ice that we'll usually find around various objects is either going to be amorphous, having no structure whatsoever, or is going to be a tetragonal, containing extreme structures. And so that's why learning more about different types of water ice outside of planet Earth is actually important because it does seem like a lot of this ice on Earth is extremely unique. It's not amorphous, it's not tetragonal, and it has very unique properties that are absent in some of the other ices we've discovered. Properties that are absolutely crucial for life on Earth to survive and to thrive. And so the creation of ICE-19 and this discovery in general is actually really important scientifically speaking. But now, as the scientists mentioned in the paper, there's a quest for ICE-20. What's going to be the next ICE they discover? And the other curious question I guess we all have is, how many ICEs are possible after all? Is it going to be a really, really huge number? Or will hydrogen have a very specific number of patterns available to it depending on the structure of oxygen? And that's something scientists might be able to answer in the next few decades, but right now it's a big mystery and nobody really knows.
Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a new discovery coming from something that we actually all have at home, glue. So let's talk about glue. Let's find out what the scientists recently found and how it might improve our lives in the future. And glue is of course one of the first tools we all get to use even in the kindergarten. Although personally, I wasn't really good at it. As a matter of fact, I always get confused with what glue to use with what surfaces. For example, as you might know, super glue doesn't actually super glue everything. I discovered this the hard way when I tried to super glue certain things I broke around the house and it just didn't work. Well, that's of course because super glue was invented to super glue us, to super glue humans. The original invention was for war purposes to essentially help soldiers stitch together certain body parts such as an exposed wound from a shrapnel from a bullet or something, meant specifically to stop the bleeding so that the soldier can then be treated somewhere in the hospital. But like so many other tools we use in our civilization today, glue has a pretty rich history. As a matter of fact, glue probably has one of the richest histories of all. I could probably write a book about it, but I just, I guess, don't have time for it. So I'm going to have to settle for a two minute summary. We know, for example, that glue was even used by the Neanderthals as far back as 200,000 years ago. Specifically, it was discovered that certain stone tools attached to wooden handles were actually glued together using bark from birch trees. And so officially, this is the first ever use of glue-like substance in the history of humanity or in the history of hominids. Because despite the fact that many of us have various Neanderthal genes in us, we're still a slightly different species. And generally, most of the human cultures around the planet at some point use some sort of a tree bark from some kind of a tree, depending on the region where they were living, to create all sorts of different glue-like substances to bind things together. And binding things together is essentially how we started to produce all sorts of tools, everything from hunting to gathering to, of course, eventually agriculture and building structures and so on. We also know that ancient Greeks and ancient Romans figured out how to make glue out of animal parts and essentially animal glue for the most part began during those times as well. Here's what it possibly looked like and a lot of this was either made from fish or from certain animals such as horses, specifically horse teeth, which is something that has been used for thousands and thousands of years. And so the use of glue became essential for many different cultures. As a matter of fact, one of the successes of the Mongol Empire came from the fact that they found a way to glue together different parts to create a compound bow that was much more powerful and much more successful than similar bows in other cultures. They had much longer range, they had a lot more power, and were usually constructed using lemon wood and bullhorn glued together using some sort of an adhesive, possibly also made from horses as well. Because horses even today form a very important part of the Mongolian culture. But in modern Europe, glue only started to be used around 1500s for mostly decorative purposes, specifically to make furniture. By 1700s, it started to appear in a lot of different industries, started to be used in many different constructions. But it was really not until 1920s when the glue really kind of exploded. And most of this happened because of the First World War and later the Second World War. The war industry required a lot of different resins, a lot of different plastics, and the way to bind them together. And because of this, so many different techniques and so many different glues started to be invented in pretty much most countries in Europe and of course in the United States. But the majority of glue today and the majority of new technologies mostly appeared in the last few decades. So in that sense, the advances in gluing technology are more or less recent. But even today, for the most part, all of the glues can be divided into two different types. They're either glues that harden with time by basically evaporating some kind of a liquid on the inside, which is of course how superglue functions as well, with the other type being the type of a glue that usually requires some sort of a hardening technique, such as the UV light, which is what you see right here, this is something that you can usually find in a dentist office, or some other environmental effect like heat, different types of light or possibly even moisture in order to essentially harden the material to then bind things together. But now for the first time ever, the scientists from Singapore may have actually discovered another really interesting technique on how we can bind things together much cheaper, much easier, and also with a lot less energy used. And they call this magneto curing process. But it's not truly based on magnets, it's actually not using the magnetic effects. In other words, it's not really just stitching things together using the magnetic field. It is, however, using the magnetic properties to essentially change the material, making it adhesive or making it glue-like. 
which is why they refer to this process as magneto-curing. You need a magnet to cure or to glue these objects together. And as always, the study and all of the other relevant links are in the description below. But in a nutshell, this is actually how all of this works. This material uses a combination of an adhesive that usually requires heat to essentially bind things together and a large amount of magnetic nanoparticles made from manganese, zinc and iron. And these magnetic nanoparticles are able to warm up or to heat up the adhesive when a certain amount of magnetic field is applied to them. And so in this case, by first, for example, spraying some kind of a material with the magnetic particles and also with the adhesive, and then using the magnetic field to warm this up, it then starts acting like a typical heat-activated adhesive. And so in this particular case, instead of using a lot of heat, or basically instead of putting the object you're trying to glue into some sort of an industrial oven, here, by just applying a little bit of magnetic field, the magnetic nanoparticles warm up the adhesive and make things stick together. And according to the scientists, it actually requires about 120 times less energy than it would require otherwise, and at the same time, the strength of the adhesive is just as strong as any other adhesive. And moreover, there is also a lot more control over the amount of adhesiveness and essentially when you want it to be activated. So certain adhesives might actually require certain temperatures, and in some cases you may want to actually turn off the adhesiveness of something. And because we can control the magnetic field very precisely, this allows for an extremely precise way of gluing things together without damaging any other parts. So for example, we know that certain materials, like certain metals, will have something known as the Curie point. This is the point, the temperature point, when the metals lose their magnetic properties. And that means that when certain temperatures are reached, the magnetic glue will actually stop heating up and will always have this constant temperature. This is something that's very difficult to control in conventional ovens. And in this particular case, they actually use the example of shoe industry that does use these ovens a lot and normally wastes a lot of energy and a lot of heat essentially gluing shoes together. And by using the magnetic particles, it would save them a lot of money and a lot of energy. Apparently, the process itself takes only about 5 minutes and at the same time reaches extremely high adhesive values even after those 5 minutes. That's something that a typical glue is usually not able to do. And this type of precision would be absolutely essential for other industries as well, such as in electronics, such as in medicine, and possibly a lot of other industries that require extremely precise heating, but also very, very strong glues. But naturally, because this is a completely new invention, there is obviously no one using this yet, and currently the scientists are actually just trying to find partners to help them develop this into something more useful, something outside of just a theoretical paper. Either way, the discovery and the research is quite interesting and definitely something that might create a completely new way for us to bind things together. But I guess for now, that's really all I wanted to mention. It's a fascinating discovery, definitely something exciting, but until someone makes something useful out of this, it might not really get us anywhere just yet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some really groundbreaking research when it comes to levitation. And more specifically, as you can see in this video, the type of levitation that's never been done before. And although it might be kind of difficult to see what's happening here, I'm obviously going to explain exactly what's happening and how all this works. But in a nutshell, what the scientists were able to create here is essentially levitation by using lasers. This relatively thin disk is levitating, uh, supported by lasers underneath, and all of this is done in a relatively thin atmosphere, which actually creates an extremely important opportunity for some of the future missions to the upper atmosphere. It actually might allow us to finally find a way to place different objects in parts of the atmosphere that where we've never been able to explore more thoroughly. But let's actually talk about levitation in general first, because this is a very, very wide topic. Mostly because levitation can be produced by different types of means. The most common type of levitation is probably the magnetic levitation. And it's also the one that's used the most on the planet. For example, if you ever go to China, one of the coolest things that they have in terms of transportation are the maglev trains. The magnetically levitated trains that uh, are able to travel extremely fast and also allow for a relatively comfortable travel as well because they don't really shake, they don't really move that much, and so you don't even feel like you're moving at all. But there are actually several other types of levitation, with most of them still being more theoretical without having any practical use in real life just yet. For example, a few years ago there was an experiment that was able to levitate frogs and I think it was also mice as well, 
by essentially producing an extremely powerful magnetic field and forcing the water molecules inside the frogs and mice to turn into miniature magnets, thus allowing these animals to literally stay above the ground. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't really find the footage for this, but the mice in the experiment, from what I remember, only kind of panicked for the first few hours, and they actually adapted to living in this levitating condition after four hours. And surprisingly, there were absolutely no health effects whatsoever, and once the levitating part was over, they were able to return to their normal activities afterwards. And in this case, this is an example of so-called diamagnetic levitation. It's the levitation that's still magnetic in nature, but is actually created when the object is forced to become magnetic, even though it wasn't magnetic before. We also have examples of so-called acoustic levitation, and that's when you use the air waves, or basically the sound waves, to force an object to levitate in the middle of the air as well. But this is something that obviously still has no physical use as well. Or in other words, it's still very theoretical and experimental, but does not have a practical application yet. Then there is something called electrostatic levitation, which is a little bit different from the magnetic levitation, where here it's the static itself that causes an object to float. It's sort of similar to, for example, rubbing a balloon against your hair to give it a little bit of static, and then placing it between two objects that are charged in order for it to float in the middle. Then the obvious example here would also be aerodynamic levitation, which is basically when you force a lot of air pressure to cause the object to float above. There's also something known as quantum levitation, which normally relies on quantum effects, but this is a very complex uh, topic and it actually deserves its own video that's going to be coming out probably sometime in the future, which is also a very good time for me to mention that you might want to subscribe to the channel because first of all, you'll be always notified when there's a stream coming up or something. And second of all, it obviously helps the channel grow. Anyway, even though there are actually a few more types of levitation that um, are worth mentioning, I think one of the most exciting types of levitation is what's known as the optical levitation. That's when you essentially use light or in some sense photons or lasers to cause the object to float in the air either using the momentum from the photons or by some other means. And this is pretty much exactly what this paper is about. They found an extremely interesting, very functional, and actually kind of mind-blowing way to levitate an object using lasers. And in this case, we're talking about a relatively large object, something that can potentially be used in industries to, for example, launch something into certain parts of the atmosphere and thus explore those parts or use them in some way. Now, actually, a quick side note, when it comes to the atmosphere of our planet, and also the part above the atmosphere, the open space, there are certain regions that we've been able to access and to use quite a lot, but certain regions are very, very difficult for us to access, even though they are important in, for example, predicting weather, or even doing a lot of other scientific studies. For example, this is probably the most used area, the troposphere, which is basically where the aircraft can still function and has obviously been used quite a lot in the last uh, few decades. It allowed us to travel vast distances extremely quick by using different types of jet airplanes. Then above this, mostly in the exosphere, that's where we have a lot of satellites and that's essentially the realm of space science. We've kind of found a really effective way to place a lot of objects there and a lot of these different spacecrafts and satellites have essentially propelled us to a completely new age of information. But in between these two layers, in the mesosphere specifically, at the altitudes of anywhere from 50 to 80 kilometers, that's essentially where we haven't really explored very much. We have no aircraft that can fly that high, and because those areas still have a little bit of atmosphere, satellites cannot survive there for a very long time either because they end up essentially crashing. So the combination of just a little bit of atmosphere to provide enough drag for satellites, but not enough atmosphere for airplanes to fly, creates this area in the atmosphere that's basically kind of like the dark unexplored area that scientists have been trying to reach for a long time. And it seems that levitation, and specifically optical levitation, might finally provide an extremely effective solution in helping us launch different types of probes and different types of satellites and objects in order for us to access that particular area. So let's talk about the study, what was done, and what exactly it discovered. Which, as always, you can find in the description below, by the way. For this study, the scientists created this kind of a laser bed with the actual lasers positioned in this sort of shape, where each of the individual lasers could be controlled in terms of intensity in order to control the object that the scientists were trying to levitate. In other words, this allowed the scientists to move the object around. They then took these discs made out of mylar, 
which is that stuff that's often used to protect or insulate different materials, and is also that material that's often used in satellites or a lot of other NASA-related launches, where you can kind of see this golden sheet covering the surface. And then they took these relatively small Mylar disks, turn one of the sides very very thin and extremely reflective and turn the other side into what they refer to as the structured surface. Essentially it was very imperfect, it had a lot of different protrusions and filaments and overall all of this resembled something like this. This is the smooth side, this is the other opposite structured side. And then they took these discs and placed them into their laser machine, which resulted in this. The discs were levitating. And then they lowered the atmospheric pressure inside this chamber, turning it into something equivalent to about 80 kilometers in altitude above planet Earth. And then, when they started the machine, this is what they observed. The disks started to levitate. And the levitation was entirely caused by the lasers, because they could basically control the motion of these objects. Now, this is where things get interesting. Even though the assumption here initially was that it was probably caused by the thinness of the disk, and maybe this is actually caused by the photons themselves, or basically the pressure from the photons, which would be, by the way, very difficult to do with some of the larger objects, in reality what was happening here is that the lasers produced a completely different type of levitation, the aerodynamic levitation. Because of the difference in surfaces here, the surface with more structure, in a sense, ended up creating an overall motion of air molecules, forcing the object to create lift and to keep it above the surface. And so what we're seeing in this particular video that you're about to see is really the air pressure causing the object to float above. The levitation, even though it's produced by the lasers, is actually aerodynamic in nature. And that's of course both surprising and extremely encouraging because this means that this particular technique can be applied to much larger objects and can potentially allow us to levitate very large probes or very large satellites in the area right above the point um, in the mesosphere. Or in other words, using this technology we can technically place satellites or probes or different scientific missions into the location somewhere in the mesosphere and essentially control these objects using lasers on the ground. Now that's something that we don't really know how to do just yet, but it's definitely something that's not beyond our capabilities as a species. As a matter of fact, in the last few years, scientists have already been investigating controlling things with lasers from the ground. And the findings from this particular experiment definitely give us a really good reason to actually try this because for the first time we might actually finally have access to the mesosphere, that particular area of our atmosphere that's still kind of mysterious and that we don't really understand very well. But naturally, it will also probably take a few years before someone develops something practical out of this. It's a great discovery, very very interesting, super exciting, but it will take time to develop this and will take time to make this into something viable in the future. Either way though, definitely something to look forward to. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this new groundbreaking achievement in regards to nuclear fusion. Coming out of this facility in the United States that has been trying to achieve this for decades, National Ignition Facility. And specifically, we're going to be discussing their new experiment that has actually reached a threshold where we can almost produce just as much energy as we put into it. The threshold that's usually referred to as the ignition which today represents a kind of a holy grail for the nuclear fusion. But because this is a relatively complex topic with research that's been going on for nearly 60 years now, there's quite a lot to dissect here. And I'm actually not going to be able to cover everything in this video. I am, however, going to be able to cover the important parts in regards to this experiment, and we'll talk more about other experiments in some of the future videos. First of all, the purpose of the experiment, nuclear fusion. So essentially, since the discovery that you can basically release a lot of energy through the atomic reaction and the creation of the nuclear bomb, scientists pretty quickly realized we can also use this to create a lot of energy for civil use. This was the formation of the first nuclear reactors. But all modern nuclear reactors use what's known as fission. Not to be confused with fission. Here we're talking about a nuclear process when a somewhat complex and somewhat heavy element splits into two lighter elements and at the same time releases a lot of energy, with the most commonly used element being uranium. But following the atomic bomb, the next more destructive weapon was the H-bomb, the hydrogen bomb. 
And in simple terms, the way that this bomb functions is by essentially using the uranium to first create the fission based explosion that then uses all of this energy to initiate what's known as the fusion based explosion. It essentially uses the hydrogen inside the bomb to initiate the same reaction that we usually detect inside our sun. Which is why sometimes nuclear bombs are also known as the miniature suns. Releasing a tremendous amount of energy in the process. But naturally, it also meant that we could hypothetically use this type of a process to create an even more powerful and more efficient nuclear reactor. Something that theoretically made a lot of sense, and a lot of scientists thought it was going to be possible within only a few decades. But this was back in the 60s. Since then, pretty much every attempt to create some sort of a fusion reactor unfortunately failed, for one reason or another. And it's not that it failed because the theory was wrong. It failed because once they started building those reactors, they realized how difficult it is to maintain the constant reaction, but also how difficult it is to create a reactor where you actually get more energy out than you put into the reactor itself. Nevertheless, in the last few decades, several major theories in regards to nuclear fusion reactors have actually been proposed and successfully tested. Pretty much all of them seem to work successfully. The only problem being that the energy we put into them is still more than the energy that comes out. And of all different models and theories that are used for fusion reaction, there are two models or two reactors that are actually most well known and that are eventually believed to reach what's known as the ignition. The point at which the reactor starts producing way more energy than we use to run the reactor itself. And so what are these two main models? Well, the most popular one, and the one that's usually seen as the stereotype of fusion reaction, is what's known as the toroidal fusion reactor, also known as the magnetic confinement reactor. The way this works is on the principle of having a lot of superheated hydrogen plasma that spins really, really fast inside a very, very powerful magnet and eventually reaches temperatures and pressures that are even higher than inside our sun. And this starts producing the hydrogen fusion energy. We sometimes refer to these reactors as tokamak. And there are quite a lot of them around the world, and a lot of them have been used in various experiments for the past 60 years. Pretty much all of them were quite successful, but none of them have reached ignition just yet. But we'll talk more about this particular reactor and its successes both in the US, Europe and China in one of the future videos that's going to be coming out pretty soon. So make sure to subscribe. Anyway, these tokamak reactors are definitely extremely interesting. But in this video, we're actually going to be discussing this other idea, this other type of a reactor that uses something almost entirely different. Something that was initially believed to not really work, but something that turned out to be quite effective. So instead of a tokamak that uses a very powerful magnetic coil and produces ridiculously powerful magnetic plasma, the new experiment used a very different method, a method using these tiny hydrogen pellets and a method referred to as the inertial confinement fusion. And so how exactly does this work? Well, the idea here comes from essentially seeing how it works in the H-bombs, in hydrogen bombs. When the scientists were studying the reactions inside nuclear bombs, specifically inside hydrogen bombs, they realized that if you were to take the hydrogen pellet and make it small enough, at some point you would only require approximately 1.6 megajoules of energy to initiate the nuclear reaction and to make it explode, producing more energy than you would actually require to put in. Because of this, they realized that there should be a way for the scientists to create a relatively simple and potentially relatively effective way to initiate the fusion reactor and to produce energy using a series of relatively powerful lasers. Lasers pointed directly at the tiny pellet that are then used to fuse all of the hydrogen inside this pellet, turning it into helium. Although, okay, quick side note, the actual process is a little bit more complicated. You obviously have to first take hydrogen and turn it into slightly heavier hydrogen, known as deuterium, because it becomes much easier for these two atoms to then overcome the electrostatic repulsion known as the Coulomb barrier. And the more neutrons there are compared to protons, the easier it becomes to initiate the nuclear reaction. And so for nuclear fusion, usually much heavier elements such as deuterium and tritium are used instead of pure hydrogen. Also, unlike in our sun, where an average atom of hydrogen can actually exist for billions of years and really not go through any reaction, in order to create practical energy out of a fusion reactor, this rate must be increased quite dramatically, which is usually done through a dramatic increase of heat and pressure inside the reactor, making it somewhat similar to some of the more giant fast-burning stars that usually go through their hydrogen really quickly. 
And so there's actually a kind of a requirement in temperature and pressure for a successful artificial fusion reactor. Today it's officially known as the Lawson Criterion. And this Lawson Criterion is the reason why a practical fusion reactor still does not exist. We're slowly getting closer and closer to the pressures and temperatures needed. But remember, to create these temperatures and pressures, we have to put a lot of energy in. And because of this, all fusion reactors in operation today require more energy to be put in than they actually produce after the reaction starts. And this is why after nearly 60 years, we still don't really have a functioning fusion reactor. But we are inching closer and closer to that ignition process, the process when we produce more energy than is being put in. With the recent experiment at the National Ignition Facility so far being the most successful of them all, reaching the point where we theoretically can actually say that it reached ignition, even though officially it only produced approximately 70% of energy that was being introduced into the reactor. So here's how this particular process works. First of all, the facility itself is pretty large, but the main part of the facility is right here in this little sphere. And this is what the sphere sort of looks like. It contains nearly 200 different powerful lasers, with each of the lasers being amplified by these really, really powerful devices that are then focused on this tiny point right here. And that point contains the hydrogen pellet. And so basically all of these lasers are supposed to fire at the pellet at the same time, heating it up equally from each side, which then initiates the nuclear fusion reaction inside the pellet, turning it into a miniature sun, which all happens in just 3 nanoseconds. But the problem is that you have to have extremely accurate lasers and they have to produce extremely accurately measured and also extremely well controlled type of light. That's very difficult to achieve with 200 lasers. And so to kind of cheat and also make things easier, the pellets are usually put inside this little chamber that's known as the whole room. And it's meant to sort of make things a little bit easier because it ends up distributing the light from the lasers that then distribute the light turning it into x-rays that shine on the pellet pretty much equally from every side, which then initiates the reaction. So all of this theoretically works perfectly, but the problems start arising from each individual step. So for example, the fact that each of the lasers has to be amplified and a lot of them have to be shining at the same point. Also, everything inside the chamber has to be extremely accurately measured and has to be arranged in a very specific way. Also, the pellet itself and also the whole realm have to be made with extreme precision. Even a tiny, tiny perturbation inside of one of these uh, components can actually end up producing quite a lot of different instabilities that end up reducing the total amount of energy released mostly due to various shockwaves formed inside the pellet. And so in the past, this precision was almost impossible to achieve. But in the last few decades, we've gotten to the point where lasers are really accurate, they're really precise, they're also really powerful, as are a lot of other components used in various devices needed for this to function. And because of this, there's been a lot of progress in regards to these particular fusion reactors. And so a lot of these different inefficiencies have been slowly overcome using new technology. So for example, in the beginning, the actual laser amplification required a lot of energy. The laser amplification process, basically making lasers more powerful, would end up wasting about 99% of all of the energy put in. But over time, these numbers have dramatically improved, making this a lot more efficient. And so back in 2018, approximately three years ago, the scientists from this facility were able to achieve approximately 54 kilojoules of energy released from the pellet. Now, three years later, They've just announced crossing the barrier of 1 megajoule, 1.3 megajoule to be exact, which is about 25 times more than 3 years ago, and is roughly equivalent to about 80% of the energy that was being introduced into the reactor. And that is actually great news. It does suggest that maybe in a few years from now, they will cross what's known as the ignition. They will achieve the ability to produce more energy than is being introduced into the reactor. Or, in other words, they might finally have the first artificial fusion reactor. And that will of course be a great achievement. But let's not get too excited yet. There are still so many problems. One of the problems here is of course the cost. So at the moment, the way this experiment is set up, the reactor can only fire once per day. That is not going to be enough to power anything. A functioning fusion reactor that's going to be powering a city is going to have to fire these lasers pretty much every second. The other issue is with the cost and the production of pellets. They have to be manufactured using extremely precise methods. And so each of these pellets is sort of expensive. 
but they have to cost only a few cents for this technique to be viable in producing energy for a city or a country. And also replacing these pellets has to be almost instantaneous. Although previously one solution to this has been proposed as a kind of a droplet system, where the pellets basically just drop from somewhere on top, and as they descend they are ignited to produce energy and then the next droplet is introduced. Nevertheless, even if such system is developed and we find a way to make these pellets relatively cheap, there are still going to be so many other issues to solve. With most of these issues really being in regards to the inefficiency of different lasers and inefficiency of energy extraction. But this doesn't change the fact that this is still an extremely intriguing and very important experiment. And if not for practical reasons, possibly for scientific reasons. It definitely can create opportunities to study what happens inside different stars and of course inside our sun as well. But more importantly, it serves as a proof that nuclear fusion on Earth is possible if we find a way to create an efficient laser-based system with relatively cheap to produce pellets. And as you know from history, every single major achievement and a lot of modern technology has always started with some sort of a really important experiment. So this right here is probably not an exception. Once the scientists are successful in achieving ignition, which will probably happen in a few years from now, it will definitely serve as a very important first step in achieving an actual nuclear fusion that we can use for clear energy. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this thing right here, the mysterious slash controversial EM drive. Originally proposed pretty much exactly 20 years ago by a British engineer, Roger Shore. And since then, quite a lot of different studies, including this one right here from NASA itself, try to see if the device actually works and if there's any merit behind the proposition. But as you can probably tell from the title, three recent studies have actually finally put this to rest. EM drive doesn't work. But let's take baby steps and try to summarize the last 20 years in, well, basically one video. So first of all, Roger Shore actually created a company known as SPR Limited that also patented this technology pretty much 20 years ago. You can read more about the original propositions and also learn a little bit more about SPR Limited, the company that Roger Shore created to patent this device, by following the link in the description. But just to summarize all of this, here is sort of what all of this would look like. EM drive, also known as Q-drive or RF resonant cavity, or the impossible drive, sort of works like this. At least according to the author. You would have a magnetron producing a lot of different microwave radiation that enters this cavity that sort of looks like this. It's smaller on one side, bigger on the other side. And the microwaves on the inside start to generate what's known as the standing wave, resembling something like this. Now, according to the author, according to Roger Shore, this will produce more force on one side, larger force on the other side, and in essence will then produce a push in one direction. So this type of a device is also known as microwave resonant cavity thruster. With the explanation itself being essentially that you get differential radiation pressure on two different ends. But there's a problem with that explanation. It sort of violates the fundamental physics of conservation of momentum. In other words, in simple terms, it's sort of like sitting inside your car and trying to make your car move by pushing not onto the back of the car, but literally from inside the car and pushing onto the windshield. Naturally, this would probably not work. Another really interesting analogy here is with a typical sailboat. Imagine putting a fan on the back of the sailboat and then blowing that fan onto the sail. Would that make your sailboat move? Now, I think most of us would probably say no. However, interestingly, there is a video from Mythbusters from about a decade ago that tried to simulate this using this model you see right here. And interestingly enough, they were able to create a little bit of a push by turning the fan left and right, and essentially by blowing into different sides of the sail. Now, it's not entirely clear if they could produce the same effects in a more enclosed environment. Chances are that it's not going to work. But in this particular case, it worked and it was a very interesting experiment. I'm going to link one of the videos in the description below. And so, is something similar happening in this case? Is there some sort of an unusual effect that we can't really think of right now that seems to be generating a little bit of force by having two sides that are different in size? And if so, how exactly does it work and what's really producing the thrust? Well, first of all, several experiments have already been conducted um, a few years ago, with the bigger one being from NASA and another one being uh, from a Chinese university, and both of them initially claimed to have some positive results. And because the NASA's experiment was conducted in an um, almost complete vacuum, meaning that no air pressure and no airflow would be responsible for any of this, 
A few years ago, because of this experiment, a lot of people started talking about AM drive once again. But a lot of physicists and a lot of scientists were not convinced. Because there was still this violation of momentum. And more importantly, because neither the original engineer nor the NASA scientists here had any explanation for what's happening here. One of the potential explanations was essentially from the quantum physics field. The British scientist who I previously mentioned in my quantized inertia video tried to explain this by using the so-called Casimir effect. Now this is actually a well-known effect uh, where we know that there is a slight pressure, or to be more specific, a sort of similar idea known as the Unruh radiation. And we know that Casimir effect does actually exist and we know that it does work, but it produces really really small amounts of pressure. So for example if I were to place really really thin plates right here next to each other with extremely small space between them, on the inside between the plates, the amount of different particles or specifically virtual particles created is going to be less than the amount of virtual particles on the outside. Or basically there's going to be a lot more radiation pressure coming from the outside than there's going to be coming from the inside. This is actually the result of the quantum physics where we know that different virtual particles are created even in complete vacuum. And if there is less particles on the inside compared to the outside, there is going to be slight pressure. Now this Casimir effect is extremely minuscule though. And it still doesn't necessarily explain what exactly is happening with this particular drive and how any of this produces pressure in this case. Actually Mike McCullough tried to explain it, but so far the experimental evidence does not support his proposition. And apart from the NASA's attempt, as I mentioned, China has also tried to create something and was partially successful according to the scientists behind the study. With China's Academy of Space and Technology even claiming that they were going to test this in space um, to see if it actually works and possibly even placing it on all of the satellites in the future. But the thing is this was like 5 years ago and since then no new developments. As a matter of fact, complete silence. But at the same time, only a few months ago, Roger Shorer himself once again tried to present his new ideas and talk about how his device seems to be working, and even claimed that we can one day create these beautiful spacecraft that can travel extremely fast, or possibly even create an engine that can actually function without any fuel by literally replacing the engines we currently use and taking us to orbit around planet Earth without any fuel. All of this sounds like a really grand proposition, but according to his calculations, it might work. Well, okay, time to get a little bit more skeptical. So first of all, Shore's explanation so far still does not explain the reasons why it works or actually explains anything that would make any sense in terms of the preservation of momentum. He tries to explain it in several videos, but unfortunately he's missing some crucial points there. More importantly, even in NASA's science paper, despite the measurements of slight force, very tiny force, of several micronewtons per kilowatt, which by the way represents an extremely tiny force, but force nonetheless, one of their own explanations does actually involve temperature change. In other words, they kind of suggested that maybe what they're seeing is not really happening inside of this cavity, but it's actually happening because the device warmed up and because things got deformed slightly, producing slight force simply because the measurement devices were slightly deformed. And because the only other reasonable explanation here is either completely new physics or physics that are broken in some way, a lot of scientific community and a lot of explanations did actually involve potential errors or measurement problems when it came to the actual setup. Which is exactly what the scientists behind three recent papers decided to do. They tried to recreate a relatively similar setup to what NASA had and to what the Chinese scientists did, and then decided to use a slightly different suspension points on the same type of an engine. And their somewhat simple yet somewhat brilliant setup allowed them to once and for all prove that AM drive indeed does not work. Because by using this exact same setup, first they were able to recreate exactly the same thrust observations as the team from NASA, but then they were also able to completely remove it by changing to a slightly different suspension system. So in other words, when a different mounting configuration was used here, there was absolutely nothing visible in terms of any more thrust. Whereas thrust was produced when the device was mounted in the same way that the NASA did it. Which of course means that the best explanation so far is really the temperature. Because there is so much power flowing into this device and because so much heat is generated inside, this seems to also affect the device or the scales used to measure the force. It warps the scale just a little bit, putting it into a completely new zero point, which when measured then appears like there is some kind of a pressure going on on the inside. And so by rearranging the device and by choosing a different mounting point, 
all of these effects suddenly disappear completely. But naturally, the original creator, Roger Shore, is not really happy with this explanation and have already suggested that either the design was wrong or that they basically misunderstand how this device works. Although, to be honest, I don't think anybody knows how this device works, if it works at all. But realistically speaking though, it's been 20 years and we still haven't created anything that seems to work and all of the recent experiments show that it was basically a measurement error, which is often the case when unusual and physics-breaking announcements are made. Which would also explain why China hasn't mentioned anything in the last five years. They probably realized it was a huge measurement error and because the discovery was probably kind of embarrassing, they decided to just kind of uh, brush it away. Now, so does this mean that the EM drive and the so-called impossible drive is impossible? Yeah, it looks like it is. It, it looks like there's nothing in there that seems to work and it does seem like it was basically just a major mistake in terms of calculations. However, it still doesn't mean we should stop trying to discover these drives. I mean, technologies like this can potentially exist. I mean, for all we know, maybe there is a way for us to somehow use the Casimir effect or the Anru radiation to propel these devices. But at the moment, every single experiment that was scientifically rigorous pretty much confirmed that this doesn't really work. And if such a device could work, we still haven't discovered it. In other words, physics has not been broken, it was most likely just a calculation mistake and things like that happen all the time. And so on that note, I guess 20 years later, we can finally forget about the EM drive. It was a cool little thing, cool little proposition, but unfortunately it's not really physics. It's more like science fiction. Hello wonderful person. And if you're geeky enough, you probably know what this here is. And if you don't, well, let me explain this to you. This is actually something that I actively used in, I think about 20 years ago, when everyone around me was trying to create a really effective cooling device for their new gaming computers. And if it comes as a surprise to you, well, yeah, I was a huge gaming geek and I guess in some sense still am. But back then, a lot of people were trying to cool down their systems by using what's known as a Pelletier device, also known as a thermal electric generator or TEG for short. In a nutshell, what TG consists of are two wires and two kinds of metals squished in a sandwich-like formation. And then if you run the electricity through this object, one of the sides becomes extremely hot while the other side becomes extremely cold. And so a lot of people would attach the cold side to their processors and thus cool down their processors that way. Now this might not actually be a very effective way today, especially for some of the more powerful computers that we have, but it still is used actively in, for example, refrigeration, such as in this uh, USB cooler that you see right here. It's also used in humidifiers and in a lot of other situations where essentially by giving electricity, you need to somehow either produce heat or cold conditions. And so in that sense, TEGs that rely on what's known as a Seebeck effect are extremely useful. But naturally, like a lot of things in physics and really a lot of things when it comes to electricity, if you were to produce the opposite effect, for example, if you were to take the heat and apply it to one side, while then taking something cold and put it on the other side, it would actually produce a little bit of electric current. And when I initially learned about this, my first thought was, well, can't we just use this for electricity, for production of electricity in our houses? Like maybe we can turn uh, glass into some kind of a Seebeck effect mechanism and uh, one side that's colder, the outside, would allow us to produce some sort of an electric current. With the next obvious question being, can I take this off and put it on my body? and thus allow my body to generate the electricity? Well, all of these questions were answered by me pretty quickly when I realized that the current created was extremely small and, well, it was actually extremely inefficient as well. This here is actually one of the previous attempts made by scientists uh, from a few years ago when they tried to create, well, basically gloves that would allow us to create a little bit of electricity. But the Seebeck effect in general is still extremely useful. For example, the Perseverance probe that's currently on Mars is actually using this effect uh, combined with the heat generated by plutonium to generate all of the electricity it's going to need for the next few years. Although the battery that it's using is a lot more complicated. This is what it kind of looks like, with the plutonium itself being inside of this capsule that you see, where the heat itself is generated through radioisotopes. Essentially, plutonium, as it turns into another element, it releases a lot of heat, which is then converted to electricity. Once again, kind of similar to how this USB cooler works as well. But for years now, scientists have been actually trying really hard to still use this somehow 
and find a way to generate energy from our own bodies. I mean, if you remember Matrix, the entire premise of the movie was that human bodies are like walking batteries. You can technically use them to create energy. And pretty much every second you emit so much heat and so much energy that if you were to convert all of this to electricity, you could hypothetically produce a relatively large amount of energy. And on average, a human usually produces anywhere from 100 to maybe 150 watts of energy. That's kind of equivalent to a lot of laptops that we use today, and it's also equivalent to a lot of other electronics around us. And that's when you're resting. When you exercise, you produce even more heat and thus more energy. And because of this fascination with humans being free energy, several scientists behind the paper you can find in the description below decided to really take this to the next level. They actually were able to create this really cool wearable device that's able to produce way more energy than anything before it. And on top of this, this device seems to be able to heal itself. It also seems to be recyclable and not really damaging to the environment. And it's modular. They refer to it as a Lego-like. You basically can turn this into as many batteries as you want and put it all over your body if you want. And they refer to it as wearable TEG. And it kind of works like this. You can also find more information in the video in the description. Basically, you have these tiny motherboards, each of them responsible for generating energy. And they're all attached to this really, really cool material that's designed to be stretchy. In other words, you can put it anywhere on your skin. And it's also designed to repair itself. It's essentially made with these polymers that allow it to heal itself after it's cut or when it's damaged. Something similar was discussed in one of the previous videos with another invention, using a somewhat similar element to this as well. So this is definitely not something that's newly discovered, but they were able to combine all of this into something that's also recyclable. In other words, by putting this into a solution, you can now get rid of things that you don't need anymore, with certain parts being reusable, such as these tiny generators you see sticking out. And you can put as many of them as you want, depending on the amount of energy you want to produce. Okay, well that's cool and all, but how much energy can you possibly produce from this? I was still talking about microvolts and mini watts here, something that I was basically producing when I tried to strap this on myself, and something that would definitely not power anything. Or is it something more substantial? Well, in this case, this tiny device that's about one square centimeter is able to produce about one volt of energy. And that's way, way more than any previous attempts. And most of all, this is actually more than enough for most wearable devices that we have today. It will be more than enough for your smartwatch. It would also probably be enough to keep some sort of a tracker or some sort of a band that you might wear for health reasons, constantly charged and operating without any battery. And best of all, it scales to large amounts, which means that you could potentially even have a bunch of these on your arm and thus be able to charge your cell phone. That's right, by eating a burger, you could technically charge your smartphone. That's kind of mind-blowing. But the mind-blowing part here is that not that it's an original idea or that they created something no one else had before, because this is something that many people have tried. The mind-blowing part here is that it seems to work and it seems to work pretty well. For example, there have been many attempts to try to use excess heat in cars to try to use a similar technique to produce energy there. It succeeded to some extent, but it's still not really that commercially viable. There's also at least one major study that mentions we could hypothetically produce a tremendous amount of energy using this technique by putting a lot of these TEGs somewhere in the ocean and then by using heat generated through hydrothermal vents, we could hypothetically produce enough electricity to power a city. And so there's definitely a lot of uses for this type of technology, but it's really the wearable technology right now that's going to be making a difference, simply because we have so many tiny devices around us and so many devices requiring energy that using this technology, this wearable, flexible, recyclable, and in some sense modular technology could actually save us from producing tons of batteries that are already kind of reaching a crisis. There are a lot of batteries being produced out there and many of them are slowly turning into a new pollutant. And one of the main reasons why this device would work so well is actually because our bodies are able to control their temperature and are able to maintain the temperature at roughly around 36 degrees Celsius when you're healthy, when you're not sick. And obviously when you have fever, you can produce even more energy. But that's obviously not the topic we're discussing here. The idea of us being a constant energy producer is definitely a niche that needs to be developed more and something that we need to kind of consider as more and more devices are introduced into our pockets, on our wrists, and of course other devices that we're not even aware of yet. Like for example, a few years ago, nobody knew that 
these little things are going to take over the world and that everyone is going to have them as well. And that's just another wearable that requires a battery. And because of the use of these polymers on the inside, these devices are not going to break very easily, unlike some of the previous attempts scientists tried to generate in the past. The main problem with a lot of these wearable devices was that they were actually kind of brittle. They would usually break pretty quickly and would not really be usable after only a few weeks. And the scientists here speculate that by having some sort of a wrist-like device very similar to this, you would be able to generate around 5 volts of electricity, which is the same voltage that a typical smartphone uses as well. Although in this case it might not actually be enough to constantly run a cell phone, mostly because the amount of energy is still going to be much lower, but it might be enough to recharge your smartphone, assuming that you keep it in your pocket. And when you're done with it, you can easily recycle all of this, not really creating any new trash. Although to be honest, this is not the only such research from the last few years. As a matter of fact, only a few months ago there was another very similar creation, the image for which you see right here, that's also basically able to do something similar. The only main difference though is the energy produced. This version here produces a few times less energy than the device you see right here mentioned in the paper. And even that is not the only version, there's even something like this that's also from a few months ago that unfortunately produces even less energy. So in that sense it's basically an extremely exciting area of study right now as a lot of different scientists from around the world are trying to find a way to generate energy from the natural heat of our body. And that means that possibly in the next few years we'll actually have, finally at least, the actual commercial version of all of this, something that we might be able to use in daily life and something that might in some way improve our lives as well. We obviously don't really know what it's going to be just yet, but it's probably going to be something very similar to what you see on the screen, although maybe a little bit better looking. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and what you're seeing right here is the world's first video of what's known as a time crystal. Now it's a complex topic, but we're going to dissect exactly what it means, and this video will hopefully help you understand the significance of this discovery and this particular study that's found in the description below. First of all, what exactly is a time crystal? Well, it's a crystal in time, but okay, that definitely doesn't explain anything. Let's start with crystals. You might already know what crystals are, but just in case you didn't, it's essentially different types of materials that form very specific geometric shapes based on the underlying structure. Such as this crystal right here known as galena, or the more famous example right here known as quartz. And the formation of these geometric structures is essentially related to the underlying atomic structure of the material in question as it solidifies and forms this solid structure. And so, for example, let's just say we wanted to take a look at the molecules of the galena crystals. The structure here would look something like this. And as the structure grows and becomes larger and larger, the octahedral geometry starts forming these relatively large cube-like formations and sometimes octahedrons, formed because all of the molecules on the inside have exactly the same structure as well. Quartz, on the other hand, has a different molecular structure and thus results in a more hexagonal shape. And that's essentially how all of these crystals grow in a nutshell. As something solidifies and as the molecular structure stays constant, they grow into these large shapes, turning into large geometric objects, like this really cool halite crystal that's around 16 centimeters in diameter. And on the inside it kind of looks like this. And if you want to check out more of these images and also find out more about the crystals, you can find the link in the description. And so a lot of things out there become crystals. Things like water becomes ice crystal. We also have sand that becomes a crystal. Even your DNA and even sugar and salt become crystals. And we of course also have something known as liquid crystals that are often used in LCDs. So today crystals are used in a lot of different ways and we kind of depend on them both technologically and in terms of just regular life. Although interestingly, by definition, to create a crystal, the symmetry has to end at some point. So without ending the symmetry, you don't really have the crystal. But anyway, semantics aside, let's get to the topic at hand. Roughly around 9 years ago, back in uh, 2012, the very famous physicist, who you might have already heard about from a previous video, Frank Wilczek, who also won a Nobel Prize in Physics, made a theoretical proposition that, hypothetically speaking, we should also be able to have what's known as a time crystal. So a material that's not just symmetric in space, but is also symmetric in time, both in space and in time. It's a space-time crystal. And his proposition made a lot of sense, but nobody really knew how to approach it. 
Although within just a few years, in 2016, the first time crystal was discovered, although it involved some really crazy particles and a lot of spinning ions, and it wasn't really what you would call a um, symmetrical material in space. It was a time crystal though. But this time around, the actual creation was a lot different and way, way more impressive. As a matter of fact, let's actually just watch this video one more time. Because what you're looking at here is literally the first ever video of an actual space-time crystal. It's a material that's both symmetric in space and in time. And you can kind of see it coming back in time to exactly the same structure after a certain period. And that's something that we've actually never seen before and something that was never created anywhere in the world. Which means that it took about 9 years to go from a physical hypothesis to literally creating this in a lab. And that's quite impressive. And to create this, the scientists had to use an extremely tiny micrometer size perma alloy, which is basically a mixture of nickel and iron, and then blast this with a tremendous amount of microwave radiation. And this resulted in the creation of what they refer to as magnons. Magnons are basically kind of like pseudo particles or quasi particles that often arise when something interacts with something else. A more real life example here would be like something like this. It's a flock of birds that forms a shape. But this is a quasi shape or a quasi particle in this case. It's formed by individual birds, but the actual shape itself doesn't really exist. And this is an example of what magnon would be in physics. And what we're actually observing here is a kind of a recurring periodic magnetic structure inside the crystal that then remagnetizes once in a while. And that's because iron nickel material is quite magnetic, but they were changing the amount of magnetism by blasting this with microwave radiation. And so in this case what we're looking at is essentially a recurring structure. It's a structure that sort of moves around a lot and then comes back to the original position after a specific time, thus creating the space-time crystal. But just like with a lot of similar ideas, kind of like Einstein back in the 1920s, Wilczek also predicted this to be very hypothetical and probably not really real. He didn't think it existed in nature or could be created. Einstein, likewise, also did not believe black holes were real. But now we know that both seem to exist and both are possible. And that's actually the mind-blowing part. It's the idea that someone had in their mind that was later created in a lab. And what makes this even more groundbreaking is the fact that this is at room temperature. These are not exotic components, these are not elements that are like near absolute zero. This is just regular metal stuff at regular room temperature. Which is actually really exciting because one day we'll definitely find a way to use this somewhere in the lab in some way or another. And one of the implications from the study already is that we could potentially use this in quantum computing. Because time crystals obviously allow us to predict what's going to happen in a specific period of time, we can use them to predict quantum effects. And a lot of quantum interaction by using qubits, for example, is actually easily achieved through the use of these magnons. Obviously, this is not a concept I'm going to be able to explain in this video, but you can also maybe check out some of the previous quantum computing videos I made that do actually go into this in some more detail. There should be some videos popping up above me. And because by nature these quasi-particles can interact with other particles and vice versa, it means that we can actually create systems using time crystals where things are controlled and where things are predicted very easily in both space and in time. Obviously we already know how to use normal crystals, the space crystals. For example, your phone right now might be based on LCD, liquid crystal technology. But this right here creates a completely new field of study and also a potentially a completely new field of various products we might have in, I guess, three or four decades from now. Something that nobody right now can even imagine. And because this pattern was clearly appearing and disappearing on its own, without any changes in the microwave radiation, it only suggested that all of this was most likely quantum in nature. It probably related to the quantum spin or some other quantum element present inside of the molecules of this material. Now, how exactly this works is not entirely clear yet, but the scientists think that because of the microwave radiation bombarding this piece of metal, some sort of an oscillating magnetic field was produced inside the material, which then interacted with the quantum effects from the electrons inside iron and nickel, and thus produced this very unusual quasi-particle wave that was crystallized in both time and in space. And so here I guess it's important to kind of note that it's not really physical time crystal. It's not really made out of real molecules. Here it's made out of a quasi-particle and in this case of something related to quantum effects inside the atoms. 
And the other thing to note here is of course the camera that had to be used for this experiment. Apparently it's an extremely complex x-ray camera that was made specifically for the experiment. As you can see here, it actually allows us to see every single wavefront, even though these are extremely tiny in size, only nanometers in size, and it shows us absolutely everything with relatively high resolution, about 20 times better than any light microscope can produce. And all of this was also filmed at around 40 billion frame rates per second. Roughly around a billion times more than the video you're watching right now. So it's definitely a really cool discovery and a super cool experiment. But what exactly we're going to be using these crystals for, only time will tell. Unlike a typical crystal like this quartz crystal here, we still don't really have any physical use for them. But the potential for radio communication and for maybe even radar, or some sort of imaging technology, is definitely already there. We can also possibly use these time crystals as a way to keep track of memory in quantum computers, essentially quantum memory. And on the other hand, they can also be used to have particles interact across very, very large distances. So definitely a lot of potential applications. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a major breakthrough in the creation of what's known as a superconductor. It looks like the scientists were able to discover one superconductor that seems to operate at room temperatures. But let's take things a little bit slower because there are actually a lot of things here to work out and to explain. First of all, let's actually go back in time a little bit and talk about the history of electricity. Well, not the whole history, just the nutshell. Basically, approximately 100 years ago, if you were to talk to anyone in, for example, United States or Europe, and you were to tell them that our entire way of life depended on electricity and everything we have and own operated on it, they would probably think you were crazy. As a matter of fact, 100 years ago, so-called electrification, or essentially creating electricity for everyone, was only talked about and was only available for industrial purposes. This is a picture from 1920, literally 100 years ago from when I'm making this video, and this was the beginning of the electrical age of the humanity. And it wasn't until the 1930s that the electrical grid became available to most households. Which is actually really impressive. It really shows us that as soon as we discover something incredible and as soon as the governments decide to implement it and decide to find a way for everyone to use it, it can become operational within only 10 years. And on this map right here, you can even see the amount of electrification that happened around the world, with most of the world in blue showing approximately 100% electrification with only some countries in Africa and a few countries in Asia still undergoing the process. But for the most part, most of the world have actually adopted electricity, and we all, of course, depend on it to a very, very large extent today. And for me personally, without electricity, I, of course, would not have this career. But before we get too philosophical about this, let's actually talk about the science itself and the importance of these advances when it comes to essentially making our lives slightly easier and, of course, more efficient. Since we can kind of acknowledge the electrification process to be more or less finished in the Western world, just like approximately 100 years ago, we're now undergoing, in some sense, a new type of revolution. An attempt for the humanity to discover better and more efficient ways to produce electricity and to, of course, use it as well. And just like a hundred years ago, today we have a new phenomenon related to electricity that has been used in certain industries but not really widespread just yet. And this phenomenon is known as superconductivity. It's essentially a quantum mechanics effect. An effect that becomes apparent in certain materials once they reach certain conditions, usually temperature. Now here's one example that you can also find in the description below, and essentially it shows you how certain materials transform into superconductors and become these unusual levitating and floating things that can move without any resistance whatsoever. And the principle here, which is based on quantum mechanics, is actually a little bit complex, but I'll try to simplify it. Basically, in certain situations, once a certain temperature is reached, the material will expel all of the magnetic fields from within and will start levitating ignoring any kind of electrical resistance as well. In other words, a typical superconductor will conduct electricity with zero resistance. And interestingly, for the past 25 years, um, an experiment by Royal Observatory of Belgium, located somewhere deep within the observatory itself, has been essentially proving the idea of superconductivity. For the past 25 years, a tiny object was essentially levitating non-stop without losing any charge on the inside, without creating any kind of a resistance, and essentially has this charge making it float above the surface 
for as long as the temperature is maintained at certain levels. You can actually read more about this in the article in the description below. And although the idea of superconductivity was originally discovered back in 1911, it was initially thought that this phenomenon only worked at super super low temperatures close to the absolute zero. And it wasn't until 1985 that we discovered that some materials can actually be high temperature superconductors. Back then the copper oxide ceramic material that you can see right here was discovered to be superconductive above the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Which was a huge discovery back then because it meant that we could use liquid nitrogen to create superconductive materials and to use them in the lab. Since then, a lot of new things have been actually created using this, including, for example, MRI machines or other diagnostic machines that rely on this effect and this technology to function. But there have been so many different propositions on how we can successfully use superconductivity to achieve, I guess, in some sense, this electrification version 2. In other words, finding a way to use electricity even more efficiently than we use today. And that, of course, includes creating and producing electricity as well. For example, for the past 12 years, a company known as American Superconductor was able to create and also to operate a very interesting project known as Holbrook Superconductor Project, where they created a superconducting cable uh, that's essentially around 600 meters long to transfer electricity from one point to another without losing any resistance whatsoever, essentially without losing any power. And the idea of transferring electricity without any loss of power is basically the next step in our electrification process. But just like other experiments using superconductivity, this still requires the liquid nitrogen and the relatively cold conditions. Here's actually a graph showing us how from the early discovery of early superconductors to some of the recent discoveries, we still haven't really reached the necessary temperatures for superconductors to operate at the room temperatures. The last example from 2015 right here shows us that hydrogen sulfide is able to become a superconductor at relatively high pressures with temperatures of about minus 70 degrees Celsius which is actually even slightly colder than it is right now in Antarctica. So in that sense, these are not particularly that useful yet, unless of course we cool things down dramatically. But as you can see from this graph, we're slowly inching closer and closer to the discovery of that magical superconductor that can once again transform our society. And it just so happens that the researchers from University of Rochester may have achieved the next step in getting there. They basically created a superconductor that's able to become a superconductor at around 15 degrees Celsius, with a small side note of also having really, really high pressures. But we'll talk about this a little bit later. Essentially, completely by accident, they discovered that if you were to combine certain materials and to pressurize them using so-called diamond anvils, or diamond anvil cell as it's also known, where essentially you take two diamonds and put something right between them right here, and then squeeze these things really, really hard and also shine a laser on it, which essentially creates some of the highest pressures in the universe. As a matter of fact, a lot of the research we do on things like, for example, conditions inside Jupiter, conditions inside Saturn, are usually done by conducting experiments in these uh, DACs, or diamond anvil cells. And the material they use for this is known as carbonaceous sulfur hydride. In other words, it's carbon, sulfur, and hydrogen all mixed into one component with the formula CH8S. And it just so happens that once you give this enough pressure, at temperatures of around 15 degrees Celsius, the material becomes superconductive, exhibiting all of the properties that a typical superconductor would have as well. But the conditions have to have extremely high pressure roughly around 39 million psi, which is about 3 million times higher than what you're experiencing right now by sitting in your room. And so even though this is not a superconductor that's going to be effective in, for example, your computer or for installation of a very large grid across the entire country, but this is a next step in our understanding and also our ability to create these very unusual materials that's one day going to lead to the electrification 2.0. Essentially, the entire world is going to use superconductive wires, superconductor properties of everything around us, and also achieve extremely efficient way of using electrical energy around the world. Such as, for example, extremely efficient turbines. A few years ago, scientists were able to create a superconductive uh, turbine that was able to generate about 4 million watt of power. That's a lot more efficient than a typical turbine. So if one day we discover a superconductor that can be used in these turbines, it means that our power generation will become dramatically more effective. 
And that of course means that using a few of these turbines you could power a relatively large city. And although it's probably not going to be this particular material, it is going to be something related to what the scientists in this paper discovered because we're slowly inching toward that progress, toward that mysterious material that is going to be superconductive in normal room temperatures and of course normal pressures. So in that sense this is actually a really exciting discovery and well, even though it's more symbolic than functional, it's going to take us to the next level once we understand what actually happens inside the structures of these materials to make them superconductive. For example, we kind of understand why resistance happens, why things are not superconductive. When electrons move through those materials, they start interacting with the lattice of atoms around them. Like for example, if this is the copper wire, this is the structure inside of this wire, and these right here are the electrons moving through them, interacting with the atoms and also losing a little bit of conductivity. In a nutshell, that's how resistance works. But when the material becomes superconductive, when it essentially reaches this unusual property, it suddenly transforms completely, becoming a quantum material. Essentially, inside of the material, the electrons now act as a kind of a superfluid. And so instead of each electron acting individually and also interacting with other atoms, they instead now become coupled and start acting as a superfluid. And just like other superfluids, like for example helium right here, they start flowing without any resistance whatsoever. And that's essentially what we believe happens inside of these superconducting materials. We're just not entirely sure why certain materials are superconductive and why certain aren't. Right now all of these discoveries have been kind of accidental. Nevertheless, in the next few years we might actually finally get the theory behind this and find a way to predict and also to analyze these materials and thus create them more efficiently and also one day discover the material that's superconductive everywhere at all times. And that's basically the goal right now for many of these scientists. And so just like approximately 100 years ago when the US and other countries have undergone a wide adoption of electricity, which by the way you can read more about in this paper right here, in the next few years, once we discover a superconductor that's superconductive everywhere, we might undergo yet another revolution when it comes to electricity. Everything we use and everything around us might become extremely efficient. So efficient as a matter of fact that we might never lose any energy at all. Imagine for example never needing any batteries ever again. That's something to dream about. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking a little bit about quantum mechanics and more specifically quantum computing. But first I have a confession to make. Even though I'm pretty familiar with computers, I'm also pretty competent with programming and even have this other channel that I haven't really posted on for quite a while, but it does involve a lot of programming and various types of computer stuff. When it comes to quantum computing, I'm still only scratching the surface and still trying to understand the basics of what the quantum computing is all about. As a matter of fact, I've been trying to work my way through this book right here and trying to understand the principles of quantum mechanics as they apply to quantum computing. And the only thing that I'm absolutely certain about so far is that what we understand as quantum computing is actually extremely different from classical computing in a sense that a typical classical computer, like the one you're probably using to watch this video right now, is able to do all sorts of different calculations and is able to solve a lot of different problems. As a matter of fact, it's usually able to solve all of the problems we usually assign to it. Quantum computing, on the other hand, is pretty much only able to solve a single problem, and usually a problem that's not really that useful, at least just yet. And for this reason, it's currently kind of misleading to call quantum computers computers. They're really not able to compute anything except for that one specific problem. And I guess the best example of this is the 2019 announcement from Google, which was all over the news last year when Google announced that they actually created something that in essence achieved what's known as quantum supremacy. In other words, a quantum computer that was able to do something much faster than a typical classical computer. But this was also a little bit misleading because the problem it was solving was specifically designed for the quantum computer itself. In other words, these types of computers are actually not going to be able to solve anything else outside of that one single problem. But despite all of this, I'm still always very excited to hear more about what the scientists are able to create. And very recently, as a matter of fact, only a few days ago from when I'm making this video, another really exciting study came out out of China claiming quantum supremacy, but this time not with some really complex 
and ridiculously overcomplicated designs that involve temperatures close to absolute zero and tools that would never really be able to fit in our pocket, for example, but instead use nothing more but the lasers. In other words, the Chinese scientists were able to create the most complex and actually one of the more exciting quantum computers, although I really shouldn't be calling them computers, quantum device that's able to solve one single problem, but instead of using a lot of really complex devices, it essentially used lasers and a lot and a lot of different prisms that would actually reflect these lasers. And so I actually wanted to talk a little bit more about what this device was and how all of this was achieved, because this is actually a pretty interesting discovery. And first of all, just like with other quantum computers, this device right here is only able to solve one single problem. This problem is known as Gaussian boson sampling, and it essentially was, in a sense, invented specifically to test quantum computing. In other words, by solving this problem, this computer doesn't magically become the most powerful supercomputer. It only demonstrates that quantum computing of that particular problem is definitely possible. So once again, you can't really call this any kind of a quantum supremacy because it doesn't actually create a computer itself. It only solves a problem that was designed specifically for quantum computing. And in a nutshell, the way that this problem can be explained is by imagining different types of light coming from different sources. So basically you have different types of light inputs. And on the other side, you'll have different types of outputs. And the more inputs and outputs you have, the more complicated this network becomes. And also because here we're dealing with quantum effects and not just classical effects, a single input here can actually create a lot of different possibilities compared to a single classical input that would only have two different possibilities. And so the more inputs you have, the more outputs you have, the more complex this network becomes. If you're interested in learning more about why this problem is so complex, you can check out this paper right here that explains it in a little bit more detail. But even though all of this might sound really, really complex, in reality, what this thing right here does is not very difficult to understand. And it also only relies on one major effect from quantum physics that allows it to work the way it works. So essentially, despite looking relatively complex, the functionality of this device is relatively easy to understand. It all starts with an extremely precise and powerful laser that's broken into 50 separate pieces. In other words, a single laser creates 50 different inputs. Each of these inputs are then sent to a lot of these so-called beam splitters. And because each of these lasers essentially contains exactly the same photons, they contain exactly the same properties such as frequency, such as polarization, such as amplitude, they essentially act as a single photon, or basically they're the same photon that just happens to be in 50 different parts. And each of these inputs then starts hitting a lot of these beam splitters that eventually create a really, really large network of different lasers. But when it comes to beam splitters, or essentially when it comes to this device right here, especially the ones where you make them 50% reflective, there's a really interesting concept that relates to them. So if you were to take this and turn this into a 50% reflective surface, a single laser coming from this direction would then have a 50% chance of going this way and a 50% chance going that way. Now the thing is, if you were to then shoot a laser from this angle and also from this angle and have both of them come at 90 degree angle, if these are basically two different lasers with two different frequencies, you once again get a 50% chance of it reflecting this way or the other way. However, there's a strange quantum effect that was discovered a few decades ago with the name hong u mandel effect that turns all of this into a very peculiar quantum problem. Because apparently if the two lasers coming from two directions have exactly the same properties, in other words, if we were to somehow split a laser and then have it enter from two different angles, it would then start obeying a very strange quantum effect. Instead of each laser being reflected 50% this way and the other way, they now literally combine into a single laser state and become entangled reflecting into either one direction or the other direction. In other words, as you see in this experiment that showed this many, many times, they either reflect on the left side or reflect on the right side. They no longer split as if they were two different entities. They literally combine into a single object but which side they decide to choose, left or right, that's essentially where the quantum effects come in. We don't actually know what side they're going to choose until we observe them, until we look at them. In other words, if you were to place these into enclosed box, and if you were to essentially never check on them until the last moment, they would be in both directions, just the same way, 
that in the famous Schrodinger's experiment, the cat is both dead and alive, and we don't really know what state it's in until we open the box. And so now imagine the situation where you have a lot of these inputs, a lot of these lasers, each of them hitting many of these splitters at the same time, and each of them creating this extremely complex, essentially Schrodinger's box, where all of the lasers are in this perpetual left or right effect. Essentially quantum effect where you're not really sure what state they're in. And because each of these lasers creates this entangled effect at each of the beam splitters, it literally creates this really complex laser quantum computer, or quantum device that is. With the overall device containing around 100 inputs, 100 outputs, about 300 different beam splitters, and also 75 mirrors, all arranged in just the right manner to make this an extremely complex, actually the most complex quantum device ever created. With the mathematical problem being solved, being equivalent to a number that represents 1 followed by about 30 zeros. And in terms of the actual practical solutions here, according to the scientists behind this paper, if the most powerful Chinese supercomputer tried to solve the problem that was presented here, it would take uh, the computer about 2.5 billion years to complete the calculations. Whereas when using their own device, they were able to demonstrate relatively similar calculation in roughly around 200 seconds. So that's essentially the demonstration of quantum supremacy for that one particular problem. And on paper at least, it was definitely more powerful than the supercomputer created by Google. But they were solving completely different problems and they were trying to achieve completely different goals. And I guess worst of all, none of these problems are currently practical or applicable to anything we have in real life. So as of right now, all of these demonstrations are basically mathematical, they have no real functional purpose. But from the experimental perspective and from essentially being able to create this device, this is an extremely important next step in quantum computing. For example, apparently in order to set up this system, the scientists had to make sure everything was extremely accurate, up to about 10 nanometers accurate. Each of the mirrors and each of the splitters had to be positioned in just the right location, and that already means that they had to use a lot of super precise technology. And at the same time, the problem that was being solved by this uh, device is currently one of the more promising quantum problems that might have applications to other more classical types of calculations. And several recent papers that came out not so long ago do suggest that this type of a calculation can be used for other mathematical principles which means that eventually we could create some kind of a way to turn this into an actual quantum computer. In other words, of all of the other computers that were demonstrated by other teams, including the team from Google, so far, this one has the most promise for being the easiest to implement for other types of calculations as well. And because it only requires lasers and mirrors and essentially splitters, and can work in normal conditions that doesn't require any super cooling, this only means that of all quantum computers so far, the laser one has the most potential of one day creating some kind of a quantum supercomputer. And on top of that, because it uses lasers that can be miniaturized and can basically work in regular conditions, it does seem to be the only quantum computing technology so far that maybe one day could be miniaturized and used for normal purposes. But even though one day maybe this is actually what a typical quantum computer is going to have on the inside, at the moment, we are currently lacking papers similar to this that essentially try to establish how these different quantum problems can actually be applied to, well, real life. At the moment, none of this is applicable and none of these quantum computers are going to be solving any real life problems anytime soon. So in other words, for now, all of this is just very theoretical and very mathematical. It's definitely cool on paper, it definitely sounds cool, but it's not really going to, for example, do your taxes for you. For that, you still need to have a typical classical computer. Also, I guess, a good accountant as well. But anyway, it's still a pretty cool achievement, it's still a really interesting paper and a really interesting discovery, and it also gives me another reason to try to finish that quantum mechanics book that I'm still struggling with. These are really complex effects, but interestingly, of all different types of theoretical physics, it's the quantum physics that we know the most about. As a matter of fact, a lot of the problems in, for example, space sciences, and a lot of different unusual effects we're observing, will most likely be explained by some sort of unusual quantum effect we still don't understand.
Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a pretty interesting discovery coming out of our own sun that confirms once and for all that our sun has two different ways of generating energy and essentially turning hydrogen into helium. It's a confirmation of what's known as a CNO cycle that's happening inside our sun. But here, let's actually talk about all of this and how all of this connects to our understanding of the universe in general and what it also means to our understanding of how stars evolve as well. Now, today we know that there are a lot of different types of particles out there in the universe and some of these particles are slightly more difficult to detect than others. One of these very difficult to detect particles is the mysterious neutrino that doesn't seem to interact very well with matter. As a matter of fact, it only seems to interact with things gravitationally and through what's known as the weak force. It ignores most of the material as it passes through it, with only occasional interaction as it passes through various objects, which is actually why neutrinos today are used for a lot of different studies. They allow us to study a lot of very powerful things, including black holes, including supernova, including other types of emissions like gamma ray emissions, which are often responsible for producing neutrinos, which in turn then are able to make their way toward the planet Earth because they don't interact with a lot of gas and a lot of different stars and planets in the way. Once in a while they do interact with our detectors here on the planet, with the biggest one and the most famous one being in Antarctica. The rough simulation of which you see right here, this was made by NASA a few years ago. And so that particular detector has detected a lot of different neutrinos from all over the place and allowed us to understand a lot of different things. But new and more advanced neutrino detectors have been slowly helping us also find neutrinos of different types. And different types of neutrinos are usually produced by different types of very powerful and extremely energetic reactions. Which is essentially what happened very recently when the neutrinos coming from our own sun allowed us to see the different types of neutrinos from what we usually see. Now normally most of the neutrinos coming from the, within the sun are the neutrinos created by the so-called proton-proton fusion process. And despite a somewhat difficult name, it essentially just refers to what we commonly understand fusion to be. Basically when two hydrogen atoms fuse together forming helium and releasing the energy. In other words, that's what we usually learn in school that our sun does in order to create all of this heat. Here's a general schematic of this process, and this is essentially how a lot of different stars, including the majority of nearby stars, create most of their energy. By fusing two hydrogen molecules, it creates helium, it also creates a lot of energy, most of this energy stays within the sun, some of it ends up coming out of the sun, but during this process some of the neutrinos do escape because, as I mentioned, they don't interact with matter very well and then slowly make their way toward our planet, where one of the detectors once in a while catches them identifying their origin. But this so-called PP cycle, for the lack of better term because that's apparently what it's actually called, and feel free to leave your jokes in the comments below, is actually just one of the two fusion processes that the scientists have always hypothesized the stars use to produce the energy. In other words, one of the processes is what we learn in school, two hydrogen atoms fuse, release helium and also release a lot of energy, but there has always been this other process that we believe also happens in stars known as the CNO cycle. CNO obviously being carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. And this is a slightly more complex but also slightly more interesting process where the carbon, the nitrogen and the oxygen don't actually get destroyed at all. They actually are recycled constantly changing from one into another as the cycle progresses and the only difference here is that once in a while a hydrogen will come in, a helium will come out and this process essentially uses up hydrogen and helium once again and also produces a tremendous amount of energy inside the star but using a completely different process and essentially using completely different principles. And because neither carbon, nitrogen nor oxygen disappear from this, it's actually known as a catalytic cycle. It's a cycle where the materials kind of stay intact with only the hydrogen and helium changing in the process. And during a single cycle, this uh, will actually consume four different hydrogen atoms, which will also transform nitrogen-15 into carbon-12, back into nitrogen-13, into carbon-13, and as you can see, it actually keeps changing the atom itself, but also constantly regenerating the atom in the process. And as a final result, we get this one atom of helium, we also get two different neutrinos, two different positrons, and also some gamma rays as well. And because positrons usually don't exist around normal matter for a long time, 
they would then also create more gamma rays as well. But most of this energy produced in this cycle stays inside the star. In other words, all of the gamma rays released here will actually heat up the star, creating the heat on the inside, and only the neutrinos can make it out. And so the theory behind this was always there. And we always believe that um, the main difference between the PP cycle and the CNO cycle is the temperatures needed. So for example, for an object that's roughly around 15 million degrees Kelvin, which is essentially the temperature inside the sun's core, the predominant cycle is going to be the PP cycle, mostly because it usually starts around 4 million degrees Kelvin. In other words, even smaller stars can usually start this process, which is why when a typical brown dwarf reaches a mass of about 80 masses of Jupiter, it has enough temperature on the inside to then initiate the PP cycle and to then basically start uh, fusing hydrogen. But when the temperature is slightly higher, when it's about 17 million degrees Kelvin, this is when the CNO cycle becomes dominant. It actually prefers to have these higher temperatures. And so certain larger stars, like a typical F-type star, will normally have CNO cycle producing most of the helium, with the other cycle, the PP cycle, becoming very inefficient at these temperatures. And the best example nearby is a star known as Procyon. It's a very, very bright star, around 11 light years away from us. This is an F-type star, it's about uh, 1.4 masses of the Sun, and theoretically at least, it should have the CNO cycle as the dominant cycle producing its energy. But because it's kind of far away for us to measure all of this, we don't really know how to confirm any of this. As of, I guess, a few months ago, this was only a theory, there was no physical proof of any of this. Until, of course, now because a very recent paper was able to finally experimentally prove that CNO cycle is a real thing and our sun seems to have a little bit of it going on as well. Which is really surprising because, as I mentioned, CNO cycle starts at around 15 million Kelvin, which is also the temperature inside the core of our sun. And that means that the core temperature of the sun is just at the right level to initiate the CNO cycle, where some of the energy, possibly about 1% of the energy produced, is going to be through the cycle, but the majority of the other energy is still produced in the PP cycle. And the previous theories about our sun suggested that about 1.7% of the entire energy of the sun is produced through the cycle, which would make it extremely difficult to detect because neutrinos are already pretty rare, especially neutrinos coming from our own sun. And so by using a specially modified neutrino detector, by the name of Borexino detector, the scientists behind the paper, you can find in the description below, were able to definitively prove that the neutrinos found here were coming from the CNO cycle inside our sun and not the PP cycle or any other source from anywhere else in the galaxy. And just as always, being able to confirm a theory that we've had for many many years and experimentally proving something that we knew only from textbooks and only on paper, is actually a huge step forward in once again confirming that our understanding of the universe around us, at least for now, seems to be pretty accurate. Because of the detection and because of this confirmation, we can now rest easy knowing that everything we know about our sun theoretically seems to be pretty accurate in terms of physical detections as well. The temperature inside our sun seems to be at just the right level to have approximately 1.7% of the total energy generated through the CNO cycle with about 99% of the energy generated through the PP cycle. And that of course is a huge step forward for the science in general. And though nothing new was discovered in this particular study, a confirmation is just as important as a discovery itself. And this being the first such confirmation is actually a huge deal. And just as a quick side note, I can't really talk about the CNO cycle without mentioning Hans Bote, the person responsible for theorizing this idea back in 1938. And though he actually did win the Nobel Prize for his discoveries regarding the um, various types of solar reactions, it essentially took us 82 years to finally prove the CNO cycle that he proposed, that you can also take a look at if you're curious about it in the paper you can find once again in the description below. But I guess on that note, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. It's a pretty interesting confirmation of a very old theory, and it's once again really, really exciting to hear that we were once again correct about the universe around us. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about something else that China has been recently trying to develop, something that might help China resolve its problems with the pollution, and also problems with the lack of energy and something that the United States and some other countries 
had a chance to develop a few decades ago, but unfortunately didn't. So let's discuss this idea of thorium nuclear reactors and why it could actually transform our society and help us resolve a lot of issues on the planet right now. But first, let's establish what the problem is and how China is trying to solve it. The main problem in China and a lot of other countries is of course pollution. Due to the tremendous requirements of energy and due to the sheer amount of electricity used in China, unfortunately the majority of the energy in the country has been coming from fossil fuels. Because of this, as you probably know from some of the other videos and of course from NASA itself, China has been experiencing some ridiculous amounts of pollution all over the country. Here is the image that was released by NASA just a few months ago, showing us how the pollution levels in China changed during the lockdown last year in 2020. But these levels have since returned back to the original value and so the pollution is still a huge problem. This obviously doesn't just affect China, it affects nearby countries and it also affects the entire world because of the circulation of the air around the world. But this obviously is not just a concern in regards to the climate change, this is also a huge concern for health reasons. There is actually a tremendous amount of research showing us time and time again that the pollution from fossil fuels is extremely dangerous to human health. Which is of course a very important reason to try to discover some alternative energy that doesn't really cause a lot of problems for us. And obviously renewables is a perfect solution, but things like turbines or things like solar panels, hydro energy or even things like tidal energy, all of this is still really not at the level where it can replace the fossil fuels and generate enough energy for the entire country. Which is of course where nuclear energy comes in. And a lot of proponents of nuclear energy have been arguing for years now that this is still the safest energy we have. Not only is it safe, but it also produces a tremendous amount of energy required for most countries. But unfortunately because of the media exposure and also because of the disasters in Fukushima and before that Chernobyl, the issue with the nuclear energy is now more political than anything else. And because of this it's almost impossible for countries to try to create new nuclear reactors. Now obviously a lot of countries are still building nuclear reactors, but not to the extent where it would replace everything including fossil fuels. And honestly this is very unfortunate. It's unfortunate that the politics and the lack of understanding of nuclear power has created this unusual and somewhat negative image that a typical nuclear reactor has. I've actually recently visited a nuclear reactor in South Korea just for fun really. And it was actually an amazing and very educational experience. I've discovered how extremely well protected they are, how the amount of energy they generate is absolutely ridiculous, but also how difficult it is for the local government to convince people that this is safe. But we'll actually discuss this in one of the future videos because I am trying to find a way to film inside the reactor and to actually showcase how all of this works around the world. Today we're talking about something a little bit different. Today we're discussing this. And this is a recent announcement coming out of China after approximately 10 years of testing. A lot of articles started to come out suggesting that China is now moving forward with developing a completely new reactor, nuclear reactor, known as the Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. And this is actually absolutely mind-blowing for one simple reason. Okay, maybe two reasons. First reason is that this is not a new technology. It was supposed to exist decades ago. This is that technology that was supposed to bring us nuclear airplanes, nuclear powered cars, flying cars, and so on and so forth. A lot of this technology, especially from some of the older cartoons, it was all based on this idea of thorium molten salt reactors. And this is not some kind of a science fiction. This actually worked and it worked so well. But something went wrong. It was never developed to be the technology that it could have been. Or has it? Because it looks like China is finally jumping on the boat and building them for real. With actual plans for developing nuclear airplanes. But what exactly is this reactor and why has it never happened? So we have to go back in time here to I guess 50s, early 60s. Back then the US and the Soviet Union were competing with each other to try to develop as much nuclear deterrent as possible. They were both building a lot of nuclear bombs. They were also trying to build the delivery systems for those bombs. And all of this was based on uranium and plutonium, with plutonium being the necessary requirement to build more powerful weapons. But because plutonium did not exist in nature, they had to use uranium, which did exist in nature, to try to create as much of it as possible. And one of the propositions in the 50s was to actually create some sort of a nuclear bomber that's able to deliver various nuclear bombs with a capacity to fly all the way from the US to all the way to, for example, somewhere in Russia to obviously deliver some sort of a nuclear weapon. Now luckily for us this has never happened and hopefully never will. 
But the US government and of course the Soviet government were desperately trying to create some kind of ability to deliver nuclear weapons across vast regions of space. And for the US it came down to developing some sort of a nuclear aircraft. And they actually came pretty close to getting them working and pretty close to having them operate as well. And here's actually the only known test of a nuclear reactor being flown on the aircraft. Something that was originally developed right here at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory the laboratory that became the center for this technology. And the technology was not based on uranium. It was based on another material known as thorium. Thorium, just like uranium, is what's known as an actinite. And just like uranium, thorium also possesses extremely similar properties. It's radioactive, it's relatively abundant in the planet, as a matter of fact there's about three times more thorium than there's uranium, and it's relatively easy to extract and to use in various production. Unlike uranium though, it cannot be used to produce plutonium, which means that it cannot be used as a weapon in any way. And because of this, this kind of doomed thorium to be abandoned as a project. Back then, the United States was really focused on finding the material that can be used for many purposes, including military purposes. And uranium was a perfect solution. It was able to produce a lot of energy, it could then be used to produce a lot of plutonium, and all of this could be used to produce a lot of nuclear weapons. Thorium, however, was not actually that versatile. There was a lot of it everywhere, but it could only potentially be used to produce energy for civilian purposes. And maybe to build an aircraft that can actually fly without using any fuel. But this did not provide enough reason for the military and for the government to invest into this. And so they ended up canceling this in 1961 after spending about a billion dollars to try to figure this out. This was actually canceled by Kennedy, I believe, and one of the main reasons for the cancellation was the development of the ICBMs. With the existence of ballistic missiles, the nuclear airplanes were no longer necessary. But this did not stop the scientists and the researchers at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory to try to continue to develop this technology in some way or another. They knew that this is actually something that could potentially transform our society. They've actually continuously tried to build some sort of a nuclear reactor for at least a decade after this, but unfortunately, eventually, the program was completely cancelled because of the lack of funding and because there were no other experts except for the experts located at the lab right here. And just like in some of the previous commercial wars, such as the famous Betamax versus VHS, there was only one winner. That winner in this case was uranium. And uranium is still a winner even today. But unfortunately, as we've learned in the last few years, uranium unfortunately does not produce the safest nuclear reactors. Yet, thorium kind of does. So let's talk briefly about the differences between the modern reactors we use today and what China is developing and also what the US could have developed back in the days. The majority of nuclear reactors today, the vast majority at least, are usually based on a relatively simple principle. They will use these very very long rods containing a lot of uranium on the inside that are then injected into some sort of a highly pressurized and usually extremely hot water. This water warms up because of the nuclear reaction that happens between the rods. This reactor core is usually extremely well protected and normally doesn't really cause any problems. The water that's located inside the core is then used to warm up the steam generator that then ends up producing a lot of steam that drives the turbine somewhere in the farther location of the facility. So this is normally how the process works. There's usually at least a couple and sometimes even more cycles that are completely independent of one another. But because this uses liquid water and depends on liquid water, and because the liquid water here is usually highly pressurized and also extremely hot, sometimes even supercritical with temperatures about 300 degrees Celsius, any kind of a sudden loss of pressure or any serious problem inside the reactor sometimes has a slight chance to suddenly produce a tremendous amount of hydrogen, and hydrogen is an explosive gas. Which is unfortunately what happened with the explosion in Fukushima as well. And so even though generally the nuclear reactors are pretty safe, these unfortunate incidents involving hydrogen produced from the supercritical or super hot water still create a tiny risk that something could maybe go wrong. But this is not the case with thorium molten salt reactors, mostly because they do not contain or do not need any water. The way that the thorium salt reactor works is slightly different. It is similar, but different. Here, instead of having water as a kind of a coolant and as something to basically transfer heat, the reactor itself uses what's known as molten thorium salt. 
Basically, it's a liquid, it's a very hot liquid, but unlike in the water reactor, it's actually the molten salt itself that contains all of the nuclear materials. It does not need to have any rods that would normally contain uranium. In this case, rods are for a different purpose. And here, because the material is actually inside the salt itself, it's really the molten salt that becomes hotter and is used to transfer heat. With the graphite rods in this case acting as a kind of a turn-off switch or as a kind of a moderator in order to prevent the reaction from going way too fast. And so this molten salt, that's essentially a mixture of thorium and some other compounds, has a really interesting advantage. First of all, there is no pressure here. It's sort of in regular pressure. At the same time, the salt itself has to be extremely hot, approximately 800 to maybe 1000 degrees Celsius. But if it gets too hot, it starts to expand the reactor and all of this automatically shuts down the whole process. So it sort of prevents the reactor from basically going out of control. At the same time, there are a lot of extra devices and extra features that prevent the reactor from ever causing any trouble. So for example, if the reactor becomes suddenly too cold to produce any energy, the salt actually solidifies and is no longer liquid. It's no longer able to do anything. As a matter of fact, this is what it kind of looks like in regular temperature. But if something ever goes wrong in the reactor, there's actually a shutdown mechanism right here that opens up this long, long, long tube that goes all the way to these deep storage tanks that I use as a kind of a dumping area in case something goes wrong. And so this entire reactor is actually designed to be extremely safe. And this video right here that was made back in the 60s also shows us that not only is it safe, but it definitely works. This video that you can find in the description below from the lab itself tells us that the reactor operated successfully for many, many, many hours and produced quite a lot of energy. But unfortunately, it never happened. Mostly because of the funding, but also because of some problems that could not be solved back in the days. Problems that we know how to solve now. There are two main problems. First of all, because the material is sort of corrosive, it's basically kind of like an acid, if we were to have this operate for a few decades, there was a chance that it might actually dissolve some of the tanks. This has since been solved by using some of the new alloys that have been invented in the last few decades. At the same time, the other problem was that there was no way to measure what happens inside the reactor because of the high temperatures. Back then, there was no actual way for anyone to measure what happens on the inside. But now, especially in the last few decades, there has been new advances in technology with a video that you can maybe check out up there that explains more that allow us to precisely measure what happens in really high temperatures and really high pressures by using some of the modern advances in semiconductor industry. Which of course means that all of these old problems have since been solved. And so why haven't we started developing these thorium reactors just yet? Well, in US and in Canada and a few other countries around the world, there are actually a few private companies like the Terrestrial Energy right here in Canada or the company known as Thorcon in the US have gotten really, really close to making this happen. But at least for Thorcon, they have faced a lot of issues with regulations. It's really, really difficult to get licensing, especially when it comes to nuclear energy. Because of this, Thorcon at least is actually planning to try something in Indonesia. They're building a nuclear power plant on top of a ship that's going to be sort of mobile and is going to allow them to produce energy using thorium without really facing any regulatory problems. But all of this is still sort of far from being truly developed because they're still not really there yet. But it looks like China is. They've had this reactor running since 2011 and is now actually developing another one that's going to be used to power nearby cities and nearby villages. And for China, it makes a lot of sense. First of all, because they don't really have a lot of uranium in China, but they have tons and tons of thorium. Second of all, unlike uranium reactors, thorium reactors do not require water and so can actually operate far away from any source of water. And China, because of this, is planning to build these in a desert, far enough from anyone that even if there are issues, it's not really going to be a big problem. The third advantage here is that thorium uh, nuclear waste doesn't actually last as long as uranium. And this means that a lot of the pollution produced by thorium reactors will become safer much quicker. The next main advantage here is that thorium cannot be used for production of weapons. Because of this, China is playing this smart. They've already suggested that these thorium reactors have a potential of being a kind of an export good. They might be able to build these in a lot of other countries providing services that way. And this is a super clever move politically. Mostly because, first of all, these reactors would be very cheap to produce, 
And second of all, it will give China a lot of political influence in those particular countries. Especially those countries that have already signed up for the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. And so overall, it's actually kind of interesting to see where all of this goes. Now, we don't really know if thorium reactors in the West are going to be making a comeback anytime soon, but we know that China is definitely taking this seriously. And since thorium reactors have such an important ability to potentially transform our society, creating new opportunities for nuclear energy in daily life, I personally find this super fascinating. With main reason of course being this, we might finally have nuclear powered airplanes. But I guess for now that's kind of all I wanted to mention. There are still going to be a lot of new developments in the next few years, and we'll see how it goes with some of the private companies. For now, well, check out more about the molten salt reactor in some of the links in the description below. And also take a look at these videos from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory that sort of explain all of this in more detail, and also show you how they were able to create all of this pretty much 70 years ago. But also kind of tell you a little bit more about how all of this was created approximately 60 to 70 years ago. This is definitely a super super interesting concept and actually a concept that could potentially solve a lot of problems in the modern world. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a new fascinating study in regards to discoveries about black holes. Specifically discoveries about the Hawking radiation coming from black holes and what we generally understand about what might happen inside a black hole. We're going to discuss the so-called inner horizon. But before we start all of this, well, how do we even study all of this? How can we possibly know anything about black holes if the closest one we know of is like thousands of light years away from us and if it's basically impossible to create an actual physical black hole here on planet Earth? Well, all of the recent experiments in the last few decades have actually been conducted using the so-called black hole analogs or black holes in a tube if you want to call them that, because we basically found a way to recreate black hole conditions using other methods, for example liquids, gases, and even the light itself. Now the most interesting experiments have mostly been conducted with liquids. For example, not so long ago, the scientists from University of Nottingham used a water tank and a vortex produced in the water tank to study what happens to black holes when different types of waves around the black holes start pushing on the actual liquid itself. The effect that is often referred to in physics as back reaction. And what they realized is that even the vortex waves were actually causing the water to be pushed down as it approached closer and closer to the center, to the simulated black hole, and this caused the water level to drop, essentially showing us that these effects were changing the mass of the black hole itself. So the waves around the black hole, the gravitational waves and also the waves of all of this matter falling into the black hole do affect the black hole quite dramatically. Another interesting way of creating black hole analogs is by using quantum effects and specifically what's known as Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a type of a quantum gas that changes the speed of light inside of it. And so by using the property of this gas where it actually can flow pretty quickly and by using the speed of light inside of this gas, it's possible to create very interesting optical analogs to black holes by using the gas and by essentially observing the effects when the light cannot escape the gas because the gas flows much faster. But this particular example is kind of complex and is also not particularly used simply because there is a much better method of doing this. And that's with sound waves. As of today, sonic black holes or sound black holes are actually the most accurate and also some of the easiest analogs we can create here on planet Earth. And as of the last decade or so, there have been a lot of experiments trying to investigate what actually happens inside of these objects. And one of the main reasons they are actually so popular is, well, you can actually learn about this in one of the papers in the description, but in a nutshell, they represent an extremely accurate representation of an actual astrophysical black hole. The sound waves produced in these sonic black holes, with either fluid or the gas flowing here, where the sound wave itself is sort of equivalent to a light particle very close to the black hole, allow us to investigate a lot of different effects, including things like Hawking radiation, including things like the event horizon or the inner horizon, and even find out what might actually happen inside of the black hole if you were to cross the event horizon. And that's actually pretty much what the scientists in the recent paper discovered. And if you've ever wondered what happens if you cross the event horizon, and if it's the end of the story for you, in this video you might actually discover that the answer is no, something else might happen. 
something that might actually allow you to live inside a black hole for a pretty long time. But obviously they're not the same. So here in the black hole we have the event horizon where no light can escape. But in the sonic black holes we're really mostly talking about the sound wave not being able to escape the very fast flow of the atoms. So in that sense it is really different. At the same time the main difference between a sonic black hole and a typical astrophysical black hole is really the shape. This one here is three dimensional or even four dimensional if you want to go that far. But pretty much all of the analog black holes, at least using sound waves, have been more or less two dimensional or well even one dimensional because they sometimes represent a single line. Which makes them much easier to study but that also kind of maybe presents a few problems because we're not able to study other dimensions. We don't really know if the effects we're seeing are going to be applicable to an object that has a lot more volume and a lot more dimensions. But despite this dimensionality problem, the effects we're observing are still very very similar and in some sense can be interpreted as what would happen inside a real black hole as well. For example, in 2010 one such major discovery was in regards to super radiance. The scientists using a sonic black hole were able to discover that by blasting a sound wave into a certain region of the black hole that we normally refer to as the ergosphere, which you see forming around this spinning black hole right here, they were able to receive more energy than they sent into the black hole. Now this is actually a concept that's been discussed in a lot of different science fiction books and just generally a lot of hard science as well because today we know that if you were to shine a light for example into the ergosphere of an extremely fast spinning black hole the light coming out of there might have a lot more energy than came into the black hole thus allowing us to produce infinite energy by basically using this particular region around the black hole. This particular experiment was able to prove this definitively. And the more experiments have been conducted over the past decade, the more we discovered that a lot of these sonic black holes seem to predict pretty much all of the predictions from astrophysical black holes. This also includes the mysterious Hawking radiation. The radiation we expect a typical black hole to produce simply because Right here at the event horizon once in a while one of the virtual particles produced by the quantum fluctuations which normally happen in vacuum and especially very close to the event horizon might accidentally fall into the black hole with the other particle becoming a real particle and escaping the black hole. This naturally drains the black hole of mass and makes it smaller and smaller with time. And though Hawking radiation has already been proven by other experiments, including sonic and optical black holes, we still don't really understand if the actual radiation is constant or if it fluctuates with time, kind of like in some sense a flame of a fire or basically a somewhat unpredictable flare star that might have these Hawking radiation events flare up once in a while and then diminish in activity and become a lot uh, less bright. So in other words, one of the questions here is, is the Hawking radiation sort of like a constant glow or is it more or less variable? In more scientific term, what the scientists were trying to really establish now is, is this a stationary radiation? In other words, it doesn't change. And also, is it spontaneous arising from nothing? And one of the latest experiments with the paper that you can find in the description below was able to very accurately simulate all of this by using a very specific gas and by using the sound effects or sound waves inside of that gas. For this experiment, the scientists use rubidium. And although this is a metal, the scientists actually turn it into gas, turn it into, well, basically an analog black hole, with the picture right here representing this analog black hole. And the main principle at work here is that, well, rubidium atoms, at least in gas form, actually flow much faster than the speed of sound inside of these atoms. So the sound wave will actually have trouble traveling inside the atoms if they're flowing at really fast speeds. And this is kind of what the scientists did here. They made the rubidium atoms flow really fast and produce sound waves inside of them, thus creating a kind of artificial black hole on the inside, with the sound waves unable to travel faster than a certain region that in some sense represents the event horizon. Whereas just outside of this region, these sound waves can travel normally. And so here the scientists were looking for similar pairs of sound waves coming from this artificial black hole with one of the waves moving out and one of the waves moving in, thus representing the equivalent of the Hawking radiation. Except that instead of virtual particles, here we're talking about sound particles or phonons. 
But since all this was happening ridiculously fast, they could only really take a snapshot of this and then just repeat the experiment many, many times. Eventually producing 97,000 different pictures that took them roughly around 124 days to measure and to perform. And using the experimental data, they were able to definitively say that the sonic black holes, and by extension astrophysical black holes, definitely have stationary Hawking radiation, meaning that it basically kind of shines like a regular star. They radiate a certain type of radiation constantly without changing much. But what's really interesting about this experiment is that during their study, they were accidentally able to create the other unusual phenomenon inside of their black hole known as the inner horizon, which is that dark part that you see right here and that's sort of inside the event horizon. Now, the thing about inner horizon is that, well, in between the event horizon and the inner horizon, because now you're inside the event horizon, the gravitational pull actually decreases a little bit, and thus you can sort of stay inside of there, traveling at the speed of light. And you can actually hypothetically exist in that area without ever falling completely into the black hole. And what's interesting is that they were totally able to recreate this, and they had the sound waves exist in between the inner horizon and the event horizon which is kind of where we're located right now in this particular simulation of the black hole. And because the gravitational pull inside of this area is lower than it is right above the event horizon, you can basically travel here, you can exist here, you can survive here, for as long as you don't really fall deeper beyond the inner horizon. Now, the thing is, you cannot escape this, though. You cannot suddenly leap out of the event horizon and escape the black hole. So, in some sense, you're stuck here. We obviously don't really know what happens here, but by using these black hole analogs, we can maybe one day answer the question of what really happens to objects that are stuck between the event and inner horizons. And another unusual discovery here is that, apparently in between the event and inner horizon, the physics kind of go back to normal. So if something makes it through the event horizon, it suddenly finds itself in a somewhat regular environment, at least for the time being. If that object continues falling into the black hole, past the inner horizon, things change again and probably end up stretching the object to the point where it gets destroyed. But right before that, the physics and the space-time itself is more or less normal as it was right before the event horizon. And that's mostly because the pull of gravity here is a little bit lower than it is closer to the black hole and also lower than it is right above the event horizon. But this is of course for certain types of black holes, usually the ones that we would call supermassive black holes. Smaller black holes or black holes that are not spinning fast enough might not even have these areas. And what's even more interesting is that when this inner horizon was formed inside the black hole, it suddenly started to produce even more Hawking radiation which is actually something that's theoretically predicted as well. So in some sense, the scientists in this paper were able to create one of the most accurate representations of an astrophysical black hole, something that has only been theoretical before this, and something that a lot of scientists will probably try to recreate once again, which also helps us understand what happens inside the black holes, what happens around them, and possibly also help us understand if any of these effects can be used practically as well. And for now, this experiment does seem to be one of the more interesting and one of the more profound black hole analog experiments. A lot of these results still obviously have to be confirmed and a lot more experiments have to be conducted, but it does seem like the Hawking radiation is indeed stationary. It basically produces a kind of a light that you'd expect from a typical star, and it does look like the more radiation a black hole has, the more likely it's going to have a much more pronounced inner horizon where a certain object can technically survive without really falling into the black hole itself. Here's, by the way, what a schematic of all of this sort of looks like, and you can kind of see both the event horizon and the inner horizon being produced by this very unusual type of a black hole. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some really impressive achievements coming out of China once again. For the first time ever, they were able to develop the world's largest quantum distribution network. And it sounds kind of complicated, it actually is kind of complicated, but I wanted to help you understand what they were able to achieve and what it actually means for us in the future. First of all, as always, you can find the main paper for this in the description below, along with all of the other resources I'm going to be using in this video. But anyway, what exactly did China just achieve? 
Well, it was actually an article, I think about two months ago from when I'm making this video in December of 2020, when it was actually reported that the Fermilab, along with the Caltech researchers, were able to achieve a long distance quantum teleportation, which they reported as the first step to quantum internet. The paper for this, by the way, is also in the description below. And then China went, well, okay, hold my beer Fermilab, because I'm about to do something much crazier. And within only a month, they released a paper suggesting that they basically achieved a network, a quantum network, of roughly around 4,000 or over 4,000 kilometers in length, connecting several major nodes on the way, along with an actual satellite attached to all of this. In other words, they sort of achieved what you could technically call quantum internet. But it's not really what's happening here, and that's also probably not the right term to refer to any of this because the idea of quantum internet or even quantum computing currently doesn't actually have the same meaning as we think it does. Now, in terms of the quantum computing, I do recommend checking out the previous video I made on the other device that China created not so long ago, and this might actually help you understand of why quantum computing is not really the right term. It's a quantum device, but it's not really a computer. And so today I wanted to briefly talk about why you wouldn't really call this quantum internet either. It's a network, it's a quantum network, and it's a network that does use quantum mechanics, but it's not really internet as we know it. It doesn't really allow us to communicate using quantum mechanical bits or qubits, but it does help us with something extremely important. It helps us with security, and it helps us to the point where it might actually create a completely new system of essentially unbreakable communication networks. And in this case, it's really sort of a solution to hacking. It's a solution to the idea of someone eavesdropping on your password and being able to log in somewhere and, for example, steal your funds. And this idea of quantum cryptography is not new at all. Even back in 2004, there was essentially the first ever quantum cryptography bank transfer that was achieved by the scientists from Vienna University in Austria. And only a few years later, they also used a very similar principle in elections as well. And just like with quantum computing or quantum devices, the idea here is pretty similar. The main principle depends on various quantum properties of, for example, photons, and various principles of quantum mechanics such as entanglement. Now I'm going to try to briefly explain how all of this works in a second, but just to make some things clear, this is not really quantum computing per se. It still uses quantum processors, in other words, it uses something to generate these quantum effects, but there is no actual computing, there's no calculations involved here, and it does actually make things faster or more efficient. It does, however, create opportunities for extremely secure networks where things become practically completely unbreakable, they become unhackable. And a lot of these quantum devices and a lot of this quantum network stuff usually works with lasers and properties of lasers related to quantum mechanics. Now, since the original discoveries of these quantum mechanical effects, we found so many different ways of exhibiting these effects in various particles and, of course, in photons as well. For example, entangling two different photons coming from a laser is basically second nature to most scientists today. It's something that today can be recreated relatively easily. But because it's quantum mechanics, everything here depends on the very famous uncertainty principle, which means that there is really no way for us to know two of the properties of two entangled particles at the same time. And when it comes to properties of light or properties of lasers that we can investigate here, the two that are usually used in this case are the spin of photons, which is also referred to as the spin angular momentum, also known as SEM. It can be either plus one or minus one, with the second property of interest being the polarization of light. In other words, we can know the polarization or the spin of light, but we can never really know two at the same time because of the uncertainty principle, which is also based on this formula right here, known as the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And what this means is that if you were to take a laser and then use this laser to create entangled photons, or essentially photons that start behaving in a way where one depends on the other, you could then start using all of these properties to create some sort of a really interesting device that can use these entanglement properties for various security measures. Now, I'm actually posting this video right here that explains this in a little bit more detail how it usually works in terms of the actual physical properties. But one of the more common ways is to first entangle those photons and then send the entangled photons that are connected to one another to different locations. Specifically, one goes to 
the person that's going to be sending a lot of data, and one goes to the person that's going to be receiving a lot of data. But because the values in these photons are essentially either, for example, one spin or minus one spin, or polarized up, polarized down, we can use these properties to convert this to the typical binary code, zeros and ones. And that means that both the sender and the receiver can now collect all of this data coming from these photons and measure the properties, thus creating the binary code for the potential key. And so now all of these lasers are going to start sending this information, the entangled photon information, to two different people somewhere out there. Both of them should be receiving the same information though because these photons are entangled. And this will then start forming what's known as the key. But because this key is based on the quantum entanglement from essentially these photons, it can really only be seen exactly by these two different people. No one else should be able to detect this key, and there's physically no way for anyone to know what these keys are unless they try to eavesdrop and try to intercept one of these keys. But because here we're talking about quantum mechanics and entanglement, it's important to remember that in quantum mechanics, once you observe something, it essentially collapses the wave of uncertainty. Which means that by observing an entangled particle, or entangled photon in this case, it will suddenly assume a certain property and become disentangled. And because of this, it becomes physically impossible for anyone to eavesdrop on these so-called quantum keys. Now, these quantum keys become unique, they become only available in two different slots on the planet, and only two different people, or in this case two receivers, know exactly what these keys are. If anyone tries to eavesdrop, it automatically becomes sort of different, which means that it becomes impossible for anyone to try to capture these keys. An attempt to capture the key will instantly make both keys essentially invalid. And this process, known as quantum key distribution, is essentially what the scientists have been trying to work on for the past few decades. But at the moment, it looks like China was able to create something pretty mind-boggling. They created a quantum key distribution network that connects several ground-based nodes that you see right here with a satellite-based node that was actually tested back in 2016 with over 150 different industrial users across China. And according to them, this includes several different state banks, several e-government websites, and also a municipal power grid. In other words, they're making it actually useful and to some extent are introducing the world's first, most secure quantum network that's able to transmit information without really the fear of being hacked. But is this quantum internet? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, the speeds that were so far reached here were only about 47 kilobits per second which is roughly around 40 times higher than the previous achievement. 40 kilobits per second is basically what I used to get back in the 90s when I was on 56k. Some of you might remember the iconic sound these devices used to produce. And so in that sense, it's not really internet per se, but it is a useful tool for transferring these quantum keys. This is what we refer to as quantum key distribution. And once you transfer these keys, they can then be used to decode or encode certain messages that would use a classical route to deliver much wider information. So in more practical terms, this is how it kind of would work. By using a relatively simple laser-based quantum processor on both sides, we entangle the atoms and measure the entanglement features of these atoms on two ends. This will produce the keys necessary for us to essentially translate the messages. Once we confirm that these two keys are exact and that they're not hacked in any way, the sender of the message then uses this key to encode everything and sends it to the receiver. The receiver then uses the key they received through quantum entanglement to translate the message and get the result. Now, in essence, this is actually unhackable. There's really no need for passwords, there's no need for any kind of other types of security because this type of network, from a physics perspective, is in no way hackable. If anyone tries to eavesdrop on a password, it becomes completely useless, and both parties will then know that someone is trying to hack them. And because of these unusual properties, this, in some sense, can actually become the future of communication, banking, and even politics, elections, for example. In this sense, it's actually a lot more useful and, in some sense, way more reliable than any other previous technology we've used for trying to secure networks and secure various um, messages. So, for example, things like Bitcoin, which I myself still actually am going to use no matter what, 
And by the way, thank you so much to all of you that have donated Bitcoins over the years. But anyway, things like Bitcoin depend on this really, really complex security using some extremely complex and very difficult to break passwords that practically speaking would take uh, thousands if not millions of years to break. But these passwords are still breakable. Given enough time and given enough computational power, it's still possible to break any password. And that's where quantum entanglement becomes pretty much unbreakable and unhackable, at least for the time being. There's really no physical principle we know of where a message based on the entanglement of photons could be intercepted and still provide exactly the same message on both ends. So by having an observer of one of these entangled photons, you automatically break the password and it becomes unusable. But remember, once again, this is not quantum internet. It still depends on the classical route as well, where you're going to be sending the actual information that has been encoded using these quantum keys. So in that sense, it's actually a kind of a layer on top of the classical information method. We're still sending information using normal cables, but this information has been encoded using the layers coming from the quantum mechanics. But in terms of making all of this work and making all of this actually function, I think China currently is on top. I mean, for one, they found a way to communicate with a satellite that then actually can transmit this to other locations as well. And as you can find in the paper in the description below, they've also been able to achieve some really impressive accuracy ratings, suggesting that they're really getting close to making this useful in everyday life as well. Now, once again, this is not really quantum internet, this is more of a quantum security network, but it can help various organizations, in this case, for example, banks, to transfer a lot of secure information and to make sure that no one actually steals your funds, for example. So this is actually a type of a technology that a lot of people believe that will most likely replace a lot of secure communications that we use today. But we're not entirely sure if one day someone actually does find a way to somehow break this security as well. And although physically, or at least in terms of the laws of physics, we don't think it's possible, in terms of hacking, you never know. It seems that hackers have always found ways around all sorts of systems. But anyway, on that note, that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video. It's definitely a super interesting concept and it's definitely something that I actually personally am very interested in and also have been actively studying this on the side. I'm not particularly good at it yet, but if you're interested in learning more about this as well, or more specifically, if you'd like to learn all of this completely for free, there's an amazing website set up by Qskit who also have a YouTube channel, but it honestly is kind of complicated, so maybe not the best way to start there. But they have amazing resources on their website with a lot of really easy to follow lessons. And so I'm posting this in the description as well, because you can kind of learn more about, for example, quantum key distribution by reading all of this stuff there. And if like me, you also like to dabble in Python or any other computer language, they also have codes you can use to essentially help yourself to visualize all of this and understand all of this from the practical perspective. This is actually how I usually learn best as well. And though one day I'll probably turn this into some sort of a tutorial sometime in the future, for now, just go check it out yourself and maybe learn a few things as well. Anyway, on that note, well, I guess congratulations Chinese scientists and Chinese researchers you definitely achieved something that no one else has been able to achieve yet. But most importantly, let's hope that this actually leads to something very useful in the coming years. For now, good job and check out the paper in the description below. Subscribe if you still haven't. Share this video with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that you can find in the description below. Either way, I'll see you tomorrow. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.